Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is a debate on motion number 12878 in the name of Michael Matheson on stage one of the Prisoners' Control of Release Scotland Bill. Before I call the Minister to speak, can I express my regret that he was late for the Chamber, which I consider as a discourtesy to Parliament, and therefore we have started late this afternoon. Can I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now, please, and I call on Michael Matheson to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, 14 minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and can I begin by apologising for my late arrival, uh, which was entirely my uh, fault and responsibility. President Officer, can I uh, say uh, that I welcome the opportunity, though, to speak in this debate at Stage 1 um, for the Prisoner Control of Release Scotland Bill. I would like to begin by offering my thanks to the Justice Committee, the clerks of the committee and those that gave evidence during Stage 1 scrutiny of the Bill. I welcome uh, the support for the general principles of the Bill given in the Stage 1 Committee report. Mr. Officer, this system of prisoner early release has been raised within this Parliament frequently since the current system was introduced nearly 20 years ago. Section 1 of the Bill will fundamentally change the system of automatic early release uh, for long-term prisoners. A long-term prisoner is anyone serving a sentence of four years or more. Currently, such a prisoner is entitled to automatic early release if they are still in custody at the two-thirds point of sentence. The system operates so that there is absolutely no discretion to keep dangerous prisoners in custody beyond the two-thirds point. That is, in our view, not the right system. The operation of this system has regularly brought criticism from the, for the reasons that it is very difficult to explain why dangerous prisoners have to be released in this way when they still have one third of their sentence left. The alternative to automatic early release is discretionary early release. This is where the Independent Parole Board considers the case of an individual prisoner and takes a decision about whether to authorise early release on the basis of an assessment of the risk the individuals pose to public safety. The evidence, President Officer, is clear. The rate at which prisoners breach their licence conditions when granted automatic early release is seven times higher than the breach rate for prisoners granted parole board discretionary early release. The rate at which prisoners are recalled to custody when granted automatic early release is five times higher than the recall rate for prisoners granted parole board discretionary early release. The independent parole board do a challenging and a difficult job well, and this bill will give them further power to carry on their good work and consider more individual cases in the future rather than indiscriminate automatic early release taking place at the two-thirds point of sentence. We think it is right to trust the judgment of the Parole Board by giving them this enhanced role. This will help keep our communities safer while allowing parole release for an individual prisoner to aid their reintegration into the community where the risk to public safety are manageable in the community. In early February, we announced that we would expand the Bill's reach to end the current system of automatic early release for all long-term prisoners. We think this is the right approach so that the benefits of our policy apply to a wider group of prisoners. If Parliament approves the Bill, introducing our, propos our proposals uh, at Stage 2, this will mean our prisoners receiving or prisoners receiving uh, a sentence of four years or more will be entitled to automatic early release at the two-thirds point of sentence. Decisions about early release will be left to our trusted independent parole board. Dangerous prisoners will no longer be entitled to leave custody two-thirds of the way through their sentence. If a prisoner is assessed as posing an unacceptable risk to public safety, they will, they will serve their sentence for a longer period in prison. 
This will help to reassure communities, reduce reoffending, and protect public safety. Presiding officer, concerns were expressed during stage one that some long-term prisoners may be left in a position following their reforms where they would be subject to what is called cold release. This would be release without any specific controls being able to be applied over the prisoner through supervision of them in the community. We have listened and responded to these concerns by committing to ensure that there will be supervision through a mandatory period of control, which will apply to all long-term prisoners leaving custody. This mandatory control period will help ensure effective assistance for prisoners to be reintegrated into their communities and robust steps can be taken to bring prisoners back into custody if breaches of the conditions of release take place. It is important to stress that the need for a mandatory control period will apply for a relatively small portion of long-term prisoners. This is because many long-term prisoners will continue to receive parole board early release or have an extended sentence in place. For these prisoners, a period of mandatory control will always be in place upon release from custody through licence conditions. However, where a prisoner does not receive parole board early release and does not have an extended sentence, a mandatory control period on release needs to be put in place with the conditions set by the parole board. The Stage 1 report raises two important issues about this mandatory control period. First, the committee explored whether it would be part of the sentence. It is clear that a mandatory control period after a sentence has ended would be very problematic given the sentence has already been imposed by the court and has ended. It is difficult to see how such a period of mandatory control could be effectively enforced if it is post-sentence end. In line with the evidence received by the committee, we therefore consider that the mandatory control period in the community should be part of the sentence. Second, the committee explored how long this mandatory control period in the community should last. It is the case that any prisoner requiring supervision through a mandatory control period will have, as a minimum, spent close to four years in custody. Our view is that the specific necessary period of control over a prisoner, having served close to four years, as compared to a prisoner leaving after, say, 10 years in custody is likely to be similar, given that both are extremely long periods of time to be incarcerated. Members will be aware from the evidence they heard that it is the initial weeks and months following release that are generally the most crucial for individual prisoners. This is during this period when prisoners leaving custody have to re-establish themselves into their communities and when challenges such as assessing for how accessing housing, work opportunities can be at their most acute and when the mandatory control period would be most appropriate. At this stage, I am minded for the period of a minimum mandatory control period of six months. Such a period would seem a good balance so that mandatory control is in place in the crucial few weeks and months following a long period of incarceration, but it does not extend too far into the future. However, this is an area where I would welcome further views in the course of this debate as to the appropriate length that the mandatory control period should be. Sign officer, reducing reoffending is a key justice priority for the Scottish Government. Earlier this week, we announced that the reconviction rate had fallen by nearly 6% between 2011-12 and 2012-13, and now is now at its lowest level in 16 years. This is welcome news, and coupled with recorded crime being at its lowest in 40 years, this is testament to the commitment of the police, prosecutors or courts, education, 
social services and other justice partners such as the Scottish Prison Service, who are working hard to address offending and the underlying causes of offending. However, despite these significant improvements in recent years, reoffending has significant implications for public services and taxpayers' money. Reducing reoffending requires more effective and closer links between the criminal justice system and other wider public and third sector partners. A Scottish Government ministerial group on offending offender reintegration was established in October 2013 in order to address this demand for better integration between the criminal justice system and wider public services to facilitate a reduction in reoffending. Individuals rely on key public and third sector services to address a range of basic and practical requirements upon release from prison. Failure to do so in a timely and in an effective manner can hinder the ability of prisoners to turn their lives around and to live a life free of crime. Section 2 of the Bill will help in this important area. In 2011, 2011-12, there were approximately 10,500 liberations of convicted prisoners, of which a large proportion, approximately 40%, were released on Friday or the Thursday preceding a public holiday weekend. Release on the days preceding weekends and public holidays is consistently raised as a key barrier to plugging the gap between receipt of support and custody and access to wider services in the community. The ability of prisoners to be able to access key public services, such as housing, welfare and addiction services, on the day they are released, can be crucial in helping people to break their pattern of reoffending. This problem can become even more acute when release happens immediately before a weekend or public holiday. Where there is evidence that suitable arrangements are required to address a prisoner's reintegration needs, and these cannot be addressed immediately upon release, Section 2 of the Bill will allow prisoners released to be brought forward by up to two days, and I welcome the strong support from the Committee on this particular part of the Bill. Signing officer, this Bill will improve the system of early release by allowing, discretion, by allowing decisions about how and when long-term prisoners are released from custody to be informed by individual consideration of a prisoner, the risk to the public to public safety the prisoner poses and the need for effective supervision. This is the best of both worlds, ensuring dangerous prisoners do not get released automatically while ensuring all long-term prisoners receive a minimum mandatory control period in the community when they leave custody. This sign officer is the best way to protect communities and to reassure the public. And I move the general principles of the bill to be agreed. Thank you. And to now call on Christine Graham to speak on behalf of the Justice Committee. Ten minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate. And as you rightly say, I speak as convener on behalf of the Justice Committee. And I speak to the bill as introduced and therefore will not comment on the um, items mentioned as a result of our report, uh, particularly matters that might be raised at stage two in amendment. At the outset, however, I want to thank all of those who provided written submissions and gave oral evidence to the committee on the bill. And in total, we received 27 written responses to the call for evidence and initially took oral evidence over three meetings in January. I also thank the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for its report, which we endorse wholeheartedly. Finally, not the least, I want to thank my colleagues on the Justice Committee, who are a delight to chair. I look forward to that continuing. Provisions to end, <laughs> to prisons to end automatic release for certain categories of prisoner were previously due to have been taken forward by means of stage two amendment to the Criminal Justice Scotland Bill. However, the then Cabinet Secretary for Justice wrote to the committee 27 May 2014, advising that these provisions would be brought forward as a separate piece of legislation. And so the bill was introduced in 14 August 2014. Now, some of what I say will undoubtedly repeat uh, what the Cabinet Secretary has said, but there we go. 
Section 2, the early release referred to by the Cabinet Secretary for Community Reintegration. This is a lesser talked about part of the bill, but actually a very important practical part. And you can't say that about every nook and cranny of every bit of legislation we pass in here. Because as well as seeking to end automatic early release, I think these measures of giving flexibility, the committee felt these measures of giving flexibility for the date of release will have a real impact on stopping recidivism. In practical terms, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, those who might be due for release on a Friday or sometimes even a Thursday when key services were about to close, which was ridiculous. The benefits office, housing, even the GP practice can be let out when they've got access to these crucial services. Because these early hours, not just days, but these early hours of release are crucial when things can go wrong, practically when the prisoner steps straight out of the prison gates into what I might call a services vacuum and reoffending recommences. Having timely access to these services will, we think, help the reintegration and ultimately reduce the chances of them reoffending, which is in everybody's interest. This is a positive, progressive measure. So while much of the focus of today's debate will doubtless be in Section 1, the restriction of automatic early release, I don't think we should lose sight of this very important practical move. And I wish to put on record at the outset the committee's wholeheartedly endorsement of Section 2. Now turn to Section 1, restriction of automatic early release. Now, I use the word restriction, and I refer again to the bill as introduced, which was just going to end automatic early release for sex offenders receiving determinate custodial sentences of four years or more, and other offenders receiving determinate, that is, other than life sentences, custodial sentences of 10 years or more. The evidence we received in this section was generally sceptical of the provisions of the bill as introduced, with witnesses such as the Risk Management Authority questioning the focus on sex offenders, given, despite tabloid headlines, that this category of prisoner is statistically less likely to reoffend, notwithstanding there have been some very, very serious and horrible exceptions. The committee was therefore pleased to receive on 3rd February a letter from the Cabinet Secretary committing to bring forward at stage two amendments to extend the bill's provisions to all prisoners serving four years or more, thereby addressing the concerns expressed about the focus on sex offenders. Witnesses also questioned other aspects of the bill as introduced, such as whether it would actually achieve the objective of improving public protection. Academics such as Professor Cyrus Tata from the University of Strathclyde argued that the provisions would simply lead to an increase in cold release. This is because if released at the completion of the full sentence, then there is no requirement for compulsory supervision. But I know the Cabinet Secretary has addressed this. Hence cold, as I suspect, in doing cold turkey. Professor Fergus McNeil from the University of Glasgow described this as an act of, quote, storing the risk, as the types of prisoners who will be kept inside under the provisions of the bill are by definition those who have not engaged with the parole board and who pose the greatest risk to the public. They worried that the provisions of the bill as introduced would simply kick the can down the road and store up bigger problems for later years. It might also have a perverse effect in that some prisoners might opt to do the full whack and thus avoid any supervision on release. Again, the committee was pleased to receive the Cabinet Secretary's letter, which committed to bringing forward amendments to provide a minimum period of compulsory supervision, which um, you've expanded further, Cabinet Secretary, in the community for each long-term prisoner at the end of their sentence. And I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's willingness to listen to evidence heard at stage one and act accordingly. That said, the committee still has remaining questions, and these are rehearsed in detail in our report. We are still unclear as to how that compulsory supervision will be imported into the sentencing process, what the compulsory supervision will look like in practice, when it will apply, but I think we've been told now for how long. We also still have questions about the cost of the proposals and the impact they will have on the likes of the parole board and criminal justice social workers, to name two. We have therefore recommended that the government bring forward supplementary financial and policy information at stage two. During stage one, we also received evidence about the availability of prison rehabilitation programmes, with some witnesses claiming there was a supply problem with certain programmes as opposed to a lack of demand. 
The Scottish Prison Service acknowledged, that some of these concerns, acknowledged some of these concerns, but countered that issues around supply may relate to prisoners' wants rather than their needs. We would, however, welcome updates from the Cabinet Secretary and the SPS on the development and resourcing of programmes, given that the Bill's policy memorandum envisages that the provisions of the Bill will incentivise prisoners to engage with programmes and connect to that. On the Bill's human rights statements, we were told by Professor Alan Miller of the Scottish Human Rights Commission that the statement was inadequate. This concerned us, and we have called on the Scottish Government to revisit the statement. For example, if there aren't access to rehabilitation programmes and this imperils a prisoner's release, they might have a claim under ECHR. The impact of the Bill on the Parole Board. In evidence, Professor Tata argued the Parole Board was being set up for failure. This comment was disputed by the convener of the board. The board, however, subsequently wrote to the committee stating that it might need support from the Scottish Government to manage the impact of the reforms on it. We have therefore called on the government to ensure the parole board is sufficiently resourced. And clarity in sentencing, very important to the victims. Some witnesses told us that the bill muddied the waters in respect to sentencing. This was disputed by the Cabinet Secretary, who argued that the bill gives victims the certainty that their offender will not be released automatically two-thirds into their sentence. But there were alternative approaches suggested to this bill. Some witnesses suggested that the alternative approach would be to commence already existing statute, namely the Custodial Sentences and Weapons Scotland Act 2007, as amended by the Criminal Justice and Licensing Scotland Act 2010, whilst other witnesses believed the bill should be delayed until the Scottish Sentencing Council is set up in the autumn of this year. On balance, committee members were not persuaded of the merits of delaying the bill. We do, however, call on the government to review legislation in this area to establish what wider reforms should be taken forward. In conclusion, the overwhelming majority of the committee welcomes the general principles of the bill. There is no doubt from the evidence we heard that reform of the court service is long overdue. However, in certain areas, as I've indicated, we remain to be convinced that some of the measures will achieve what they set out to achieve. But on behalf of the committee, I encourage the Parliament to support the general principles of the Bill at decision time tonight. Thank you very much. Many thanks. And I now call on Elaine Murray. Ten minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And uh, can I also thank, uh, uh, start by thanking the clerks and the witnesses uh, for their efforts in, in bringing a lot of issues to our attention during uh, the stage one process. The SNP manifesto in 2011 stated that they remain committed to ending automatic early release once the criteria set by the McLeish Commission are met. But let's be clear, section one of this bill does not end automatic early release. As introduced, it would affect, have, have affected only 1% of offenders. If amended as suggested, it will affect 3%. The vast majority of offenders and the perceptions of sentencing of the vast majority of victims of crime will not be affected by the bill, even in its amended form. Of the people receiving a custodial sentence in 2012-13, 317 offenders were serving sentences of over four years, 47 were serving life or indeterminate sentences, and 14,084 were given short-term sentences of under four years. These offenders serving short-term sentences will still be released after serving one half of the sentence. And, other than sex offenders serving six months or more, they will not be subject to supervision by criminal justice social work. In 2011-12, the reconviction rate for offenders serving between three and six months was 53%, whereas that of prisoners serving over four years was 13%. And the Scottish Government is not making much progress in achieving the reduction in prison population recommended by the McLeish Committee. The Cabinet Secretary cited some figures today. However, the prison population statistics go up and down. In 2011-12, for example, there was an increase in the average prison population of 4% over the previous year, a 9% increase, increase in remand and 3% in the sentence population. With a projection, this is the Scottish Government's own figures, that the average prison population would increase to 9,500 by 2020-21. So it doesn't look as if automatic early release is going to be ended in the near future or even in the medium term. The policy memorandum to the bill states that its provisions will improve public safety. 
It is debatable to what extent it does so when it legislates for a cohort of prisoners with the lowest reconviction rates. Obviously, these offenders have been convicted for much more serious crimes and therefore their reoffending could be much more dangerous. However, Dr Monica Barry of the University of Strathclyde told the committee when giving evidence that the original, uh, on the original bill that sex offenders are the most compliant of ex-prisoners that you will find. The Risk Management Authority agreed, based on the, the parole board's, board's statistics, and suggested that the bill should refocus on serious harm rather than offence type. Dr Monica Barry also advised the committee that if the government is piloting this with high-risk violent offenders and sex offenders, it is probably piloting it with the wrong people. If it is going to abolish early release, it should be going for the lower end, such as dangerous driving, which is probably a higher risk to the public than sex offenders, or common street crimes such as shoplifting, theft or breach of the peace. One of the major concerns over the bill as drafted was that violent offenders who did not qualify for early release would be released into the community cold, with no supervision. Sex offenders are subject to the multi-agency public protection arrangements, or MAPA as they're known, with regard to the risk they pose in release. But although legislation permits this to be extended to violent offenders, the provisions have not yet been commenced. There was not much to recommend the bill as drafted. Rather than improving public safety, it could have jeopardised public safety by releasing dangerous, unreformed, violent offenders into the community without supervision and in singling out sex offenders serving long-term sentences whom the committee was advised are less likely to reoffend. The Justice Secretary, therefore, is to be commended for listening to the evidence of witnesses and subsequently proposing amendments which extend the ending of automatic early release to all long-term prisoners and, importantly, to ensure that all such prisoners are subject to supervision on release, including when they have served the full term of their sentence. However, without seeing the amendments, it is difficult to comment much further other than to welcome his recognition that the original bill was seriously flawed. To what extent will the amended bill equate to a partial introduction, for example, of the provisions of the Custodial Sentences and Weapons Scotland Act 2007 as amended by the Criminal Justice and Licensing Scotland Act 2010, introducing for long-term prisoners sentences which are composed of a part which must be served in custody and a part which will be served under supervision in the community? Witnesses at the final evidence session taken after the Cabinet Secretary had written to the committee regarding his intentions to amend the bill were unclear whether he was proposing adding compulsory supervision onto sentences already completed in custody or provi providing compulsory supervision in the community as part of the original sentence. According to Dr Barry and Professor Fergus McNeill, the former would amount to a type of new sentence. Scottish Labour agree that there should be clarity in sentencing and that victims, the community and offenders should understand what the sentence imposed means in practice. Unfortunately, as things stand at the current time, it isn't clear how this is going to be achieved. Moreover, it will only be achieved for victims of a small number of albeit of serious offences. Several witnesses express, express concerns that the bill only addresses backdoor sentencing, the release arrangements, but does not consider what they termed front door sentencing or sending people to prison in the first place. It was suggested by the Howard League and Professors McNeill and Tata that the work of the Scottish Sentencing Council, which we understand will at long last be set up in October this year, <clears throat> is being preempted by this legislation. Professor Tata told the committee, one of the beauties of such a body is that it can be a buffer between the judiciary, the parole board, the SBS, social work and other parts of the system that are trying to do their job and, if you like, penal populism. It can take the heat out of the situation. If a case is given to the Sentencing Council to be looked at, that immediately takes it away from the control of ministers and the political pressures that they are under. And of course, we are all under those pressures too. There are also significant human rights concerns, as Christine Graham has already said. Professor Miller described the human rights impact statement as not adequate, and he had particular concerns about offenders' rights if they are refused early release by the parole board under circumstances where rehabilitation programmes, which may have made them eligible, have not been available. An answer received by my colleague Graham Pearson uh, last month revealed that of the 900 sex offenders currently in custody, 120 had completed or were undergoing the sex offender programme moving forward, making changes. 150 offenders had been assessed as potentially benefiting from the programme and, to quote the answer, uh, provided by the uh, Chief Executive of the Prison Service, this may proceed up uh, to do so according to their case management plan, their continued motivation and, importantly, as resources allow. And he said also that 100 offenders had re refused treatment. Now, 
uh, the chief executive of the Scottish Prison Service, Colin McConnell, spoke to the committee about the difference between wants and needs. But in this answer, the, here are 156 offenders who have been assessed as potentially benefiting from the programme, but may only get it if resources allow. Now, if any of these offenders is refused early release because they haven't been able to access the MFMC programme because of a lack of resource, that offender may well have a human rights challenge. And I think that's something that really needs to be looked at. As both the Cabinet Secretary and uh, Christine Graham said, uh, Section 2 of the Bill, which introduces early release for the community reintegration, that was welcomed by all witnesses and indeed by all members of the committee, uh, as it was seen to would be of benefit to those prisoners who may be released at the weekend without service, uh, uh, adequate services being in place for them after release. The decision to substantially amend the bill at stage two means that neither the policy memorandum nor the financial memorandum are, are now accurate. And once the Cabinet Secretary has decided on the exact form of his amendments at stage two, we would believe it will be necessary to issue supplementary memorandums reflecting the significant changes in the bill. Had the Cabinet Secretary not indicated that he was prepared to amend the bill at stage two, Scottish Labour would have voted against the bill as drafted tonight. It would have ended automatic early release for only a very small number of offenders, only 1%, whilst having the unintended consequence of releasing dangerous, unreformed offenders cold into the community without supervision at the end of their sentence. Their automatic early release would have been withdrawn, but potentially they could have been of greater danger to the public at the point of release. The original plan, of course, was to introduce the, these provisions as stage two amendments to the Criminal Justice Bill, which, as we know, was suspended uh, pending the bonhomie review of any safeguards required uh, by the abolition of the requirement for corroboration. Thankfully, this did not happen, and it didn't come in as a stage two amendment to that bill, because under those circumstances, the proposals would not have been subject to the degree of scrutiny which has been applied to this bill, scrutiny which has resulted in the current Cabinet Secretary listening to the concerns of witnesses and indicated that he was, able, he was prepared to substantially amend the bill. As he has done so, we will support the bill at stage one. We do not yet know what the amendments will be or, how, or whether they will adequately address the points made to the committee by witnesses, and these discussions are a matter for stages two and three, and we will come to our conclusion at those stages. Scottish Labour wants to go further than this bill on sentencing policy and on the transparency of sentencing. But even with the, with the amendments proposed, this bill will not be enough. But we are prepared to give the, the government the benefit of the doubt and to support the bill tonight in the hope that after amendment at stage two, it will achieve, albeit to a limited extent, a better outcome than the current situation. Many thanks. And now call in Margaret Mitchell. Six minutes or so, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This stage one debate on the prisoner's control of release Scotland bill is an important one. And I thank the Justice Committee clerks, the convener and fellow co committee members for all their hard work and pay tribute to all the witnesses who gave such invaluable evidence. The bill has two main sections. The second section seeks to provide the prison service with the power to release prisoners up to two days early to facilitate community reintegration. This is a sensible provision and seeks to create the flexibility to ensure that the appropriate through care, including housing, etc., is in place for these prisoners in an effort to deal with some of the problems we know leads to reoffending when they're released. Turning now to section one, whilst I sympathise with the predicament the new cabinet secretary has inherited, it doesn't alter the fact that the bill as drafted and now with the proposed stage two amendments has been introduced in such a way that it's fair to say it's nothing short of a dog's breakfast. The aim of the bill as drafted is to reduce reoffending and increase public safety which was the supposed rationale behind targeting offenders with sentences of over 10 years and sex offenders serving sentences of four years or more. But in terms of reoffending, as witnesses pointed out, there is no logic in then targeting this particular group, given the evidence shows that sex offenders have the lowest reoffending rates of all the categories of prisoners. And in addition to this, the bill as introduced would apply to less than 1% of the offenders across Scotland. The Cabinet Secretary clearly recognised that the original proposals fell well short of the mark. 
So it was an improvement which the Scottish Conservatives welcomed when the Cabinet Secretary indicated he intended to extend abolishing automatic early release to all prisoners serving long-term sentences of four years or more, meaning at least we've moved from the bill covering 1% of prisoners to now 3%. But it doesn't alter the fact that 97% will still be automatically released early. And according to the Cabinet Secretary himself, when giving evidence, it's worth keeping in mind, and I quote, that we are talking about a very small number of prisoners, and it will be several years into the future before any of this will start to have an impact. It is a real concern, therefore, as the Law Society stated that the most radical change in custodial sentencing policy for 22 years is to be introduced by way of government amendments at stage two. Um, if you don't mind, uh, I'll make some progress. Um, presiding officer, this is not a precedent that the Scottish Parliament should set or encourage, nor is the Cabinet Secretary's piecemeal filtering down of more information as recently as yesterday in order to attempt to address the numerous unanswered questions this change has prompted any more acceptable. Furthermore, evidence from witnesses such as Strathclyde University's pro uh, Professor Cyrus Tata highlighted the fact that the proposals could result in a prisoner being released without supervision in what has been termed cold release. And he confirmed that in these cases, they are more likely to re-offend. Moreover, instead of clarifying already complicated sentencing policy, to quote Dr. Man Monica Barry from Strathclyde University, the bill merely muddies the waters. Victim Support Scotland wants greater clarity and transparency in the system so victims and the community are better able to understand sentencing, which is why they support the Scottish Conservatives' call for the ending of automatic early release for all prisoners, which would provide that clarity and honesty in sentencing. Witnesses have also raised issues regarding the shortage of places on rehabilitation programmes in prison. With demand uh, outstripping supply, there is, as confirmed by Professor Miller, an issue about the human rights impact statement being inadequate. The committee therefore recommended an independent assessment be carried out um, on the provision and availability of these rehabilitation, rehabilitation programmes in prison. I look forward to the, the Cabinet Secretary's response to that particular point. Presiding Officer, the Justice Committee's task was to scrutinise this bill. In addition to all the flaws identified, identified above, it is now being asked to form a view on a policy change announced at the final hour without sight of a revised policy memorandum, financial memorandum or explanatory notes on the bill. This is hardly conducive to effective scrutiny and stakeholders across the board have e echoed this statement with many witnesses calling for the bill to be withdrawn. And it is for these reasons that I dissented from agreeing the general principles of the Bill and Committee, and it is why the Scottish Conservatives will be abstaining at stage one this afternoon. Thank you. We now turn to the open debate speeches of six minutes, please. And I call on Nigel Dawn, who is speaking on behalf of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, to be followed by Roderick Campbell. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I speak today on this bill in my capacity as the Convener of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Whilst the bill contains only one delegated power, the Committee has concerns as to how that power might be exercised. Indeed, the strength of the Committee's concerns is such that the Committee agreed that I should take the unusual step of contributing to today's debate from the Committee's perspective. Section 3.2 of the bill provides that Scottish Ministers may by order bring Sections 1 and 2 of the Bill into force on an appointed day. Section 3.3 provides that such a commencement order may include transitional, transitory or saving provision. In considering the Bill, the Committee noted that a commencement order made under Section 3 will not be subject to any form of parliamentary procedure 
irrespective of whether or not such an order includes transitional provisions. It is that provision for, attainment, for attachment of such transitional provisions to a commencement order combined with the lack of opportunity for parliamentary scrutiny to be afforded to such provisions that prompts me to speak today. I should say that the committee has accepted in principle that transitional, transitory and saving provisions may be required in the commencement order under the bill, but it considers that the use of such provisions could have a significant effect on certain persons affected by the bill. The committee noted, for example, that a commencement order made under section three could contain transitional provisions relating to the adjustment of prison release dates and that it may be possible for the powers to be exercised in such a way as to have a different effect on different prisoners. The possibility of differential effects on prisoners could, depending upon the provisions, raise consideration of rights which are protected by the European Convention on Human Rights. The committee wrote to the Scottish Government to ask whether it would consider bringing forward an amendment to make the power at Section 3.2 subject to parliamentary scrutiny in the form of either a negative or a formative procedure. The Government's response explained the powers in Sections 3.2 and 3.3 will be used to make a straightforward commencement order, which will relate specifically to the commencement of the Bill. The Scottish Government, therefore, did not consider it necessary for the power to be subject to any form of parliamentary scrutiny. On considering the response, however, the Committee remained of the view that when a commencement order includes transitional, transitory or saving provision in terms of Section 3 of the Bill, it should be subject to parliamentary scrutiny. The Committee therefore recommended in its report that the Scottish Government bring forward an appropriate amendment at stage true to make a commencement order made under Section 3.2 subject to negative procedure where it contains transitional, transitory or saving provisions. The Government's response to the report, however, reiterated its view that it would not be appropriate for the power at Section 3.2 to be subject to any form of parliamentary procedure other than being laid before Parliament. The Government also pointed out that Parliament will be given an opportunity to express its views on the commencement order made under Section 3 when it's laid before Parliament. We are not persuaded by that response. The Committee remains of the view that where a commencement order includes transitional, transitory or saving provision, of the potential significance as one contained within this bill, then such a power should be subject to parliamentary scrutiny. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Don. It, is it the committee's view that this is not simply a matter in relation to this bill, but one we would wish to see apply in similar circumstances and similar bills in future? Uh, I, uh, I, I think the member makes an absolutely fair point, uh, and as a member of that committee, I think he will. Might, well, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, he will recognise that this is our concern. We do try to bring principled arguments uh, to this bill as to every other. The point that I'm making now is actually one that I would make about any other bill in similar circumstances. Merely providing it for it to be laid does not, in the view of the committee, allow the Parliament sufficient opportunity to scrutinise such an order, nor does it offer the Parliament any sanction should it have any concern about that order. I would therefore welcome an assurance today that the Scottish Government would reflect on this matter further with a view to amending the bill at stage two. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much. And I now call on Roderick Campbell to be followed by Jane Baxter, six minutes or thereby. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In historical terms, parole is quite recent. The parole board was set up only in 1968 and parole itself was subject to an important review by Lord Kincraig in 1989. In that report, Lord King Craig stated, quote, the proper objective of parole is to ensure that the release of all long-term prisoners takes place under such conditions and at such a time within the overall sentence of the court that the risk to the public may be minimized and that decisions on the conditions and timing of release take into account, amongst other things, of any changes in the offender or his circumstances and any increased knowledge of the offender since the passing of the original sentence. That was the position then, and in my view, remains true today. Of course, the Conservative government of the day implemented the changes proposed by Lord King Craig in the 1993 Act. And it's interesting to read the comments of Ian Lang at that time on the Prisoners and Criminal Proceedings Scotland Act as it became known. He argued in support of the then new early release provisions and in opposition to those who argued that the sentence of the court should mean precisely what it says. Times have moved on, of course, the modern Conservative Party would appear to take a different view. 
Although I have to say, I still find it rather difficult uh, to accept that a party that is opposed uh, to uh, in beliefs in ending automatic release across the board can dissent from the general principles of this bill. Turning to the committee's report itself, I think it's fair to say that in the course of our evidence sessions, there was disquiet over the fact that sex offenders serving four years or more were particularly highlighted in the bill, as opposed to all offenders serving sentences of four years or more. And it's certainly far more appropriate, in my view, to concentrate on the length of the sentence rather than the type of offender. So I warmly welcome the proposed amendments at stage two. But we also need to bear in mind that this bill is in addition to the existing powers available to the courts in relation to extended sentences, where at the time of sentencing, offenders are thought likely to pose a continuing risk. So what we're talking about with this bill is something which even under the likely amendments at stage two will apply to a small cohort of prisoners, approximately 3% of offenders receiving a determinate sentence in any one year. Of course, its full impact will be measured over several years. And, has been, and as has been pointed out on numerous occasions since the McLeish Commission reported, until overall prison numbers are significantly reduced, it will not be possible to extend provisions in relation to the ending of automatic early release more widely. But it is a start. As the Cabinet Secretary has already said this afternoon, particularly when we recognise that someone released automatically at present is approximately seven times more likely to breach their licence conditions than someone released after a decision by the Parole Board. As the Cabinet Secretary said in evidence to us, the rate at which non-parole release prisoners breached their licensing conditions was 37% compared with 5.5% for parole release prisoners in 2012-13. And I hope it will enable proper focus on rehabilitative programmes, which go hand in hand with the ending of automatic early release itself. As the policy memorandum makes clear, the absence of automatic uh, release may encourage greater interest in participation in these programmes. How great an incentive remains to be seen, but I am encouraged that Professor Alan Miller of the Scottish Human Rights Commission accepted that it was something that would certainly provide an incentive to participate. The important thing in terms of rehabilitation must surely be to ensure that we have resources available. As Colin McConnell of the Scottish Prison Service said in evidence, quote, we need to prioritise and sensitise the opportunities that best match the needs of the individual recognising, he said, quote, we do not always match their wants. As the government point out in their response, however, the Scottish Prison Service are shortly to put in hand a review of SPS programmes to be conducted by an external expert, and clearly that should be a priority. Protection of the public has to remain paramount. We heard concerns and evidence about what was described as cold release, and I think the government has been wise to respond to those concerns. SACRO, in their written submission, suggested a period of compulsory supervision of three months before the end of sentence. Colin McConnell, in evidence, said it was his experience that the first six to 12 weeks <coughs> after release can be extremely risky. The government, in their response, indicate they are minded to provide for a mandatory control period of six months as a minimum, to provide sufficient time to balance the need for any necessary protective conditions with work by the Criminal Justice Social Work Department in assisting the prisoner with their reintegration and rehabilitation in the community. I believe that this is a very considered response to the concerns we heard in evidence, and I warmly welcome that. We, of course, heard evidence about the need for clarity in sentencing, which was a particular concern of Victim Support Scotland. It's quite clear, however, from the bill itself that that is not the purpose of this legislation. However, I think we should wish the new Scottish Sentencing Council well in their task particularly in promoting greater awareness and, uh, and understanding of sentencing policy and practice. In, in relation to Section 2, the, the date of release, I simply echo what's already been said uh, and, uh, like the committee in general, fully support this. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, this bill will change significantly at Stage 2. The Government, in my view, has seized the initiative and signalled its intentions in that respect already, and it's to be welcomed. I believe we ought to consider taking further evidence at Stage 2, however, but I don't share the views of those that we should seek to abandon this bill and that this is a matter best left to others, such as the new Sentencing Council. I do believe we need to continue to respond to public concerns and not to delay further a significant change in response to those concerns. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Many thanks. I now call on Jane Baxter to be followed by Christian Allard, a generous six minutes. Thank you. There is little doubt that the criminal justice system in Scotland is in desperate need of reform. The aspect of that system which this bill seeks to address, sentencing, is obviously a contentious issue, 
But I think we will find near unanimous support in this chamber for the ending of the automatic release of sorts of offenders covered by this Bill's provisions. That, however, does not mean that this legislation and the Scottish Government's overall approach to sentencing has been a straightforward process. That the Scottish Government attempted to squeeze the content of this important Bill into a previous Bill is regrettable, but we should be grateful that they listened to the recommendations of the Justice Committee to place it in a freestanding piece of legislation. We should first perhaps examine the recent past. Scottish Labour introduced an innovative form of judicial disposal in 2007. The introduction of sentences which would comprise a, a custodial plus a community part in the Custodial Sentences and Weapons Act 2007 was a move welcomed by many in the criminal, criminal justice community as a sound and well thought through measure. The Scottish Government chose not to put these proposals into practice. In fact, they chose to heavily amend the disposals in the Criminal Justice and Licensing Scotland Act 2010. These new proposals have never been enacted by the Scottish Government, but nevertheless, we are now where we are with this Bill under consideration. The Bill fails to address what we could regard as the other end of the conversation, sentencing. Scottish Labour agrees entirely with victim support groups that there needs to be clarity in sentencing. Victims, the community and offenders need to understand what the sentence passed by the judge or sheriff means in practice. It's not good enough that victims of crime and their families hear that someone is sentenced to X number of years in prison, but have no idea what that means in reality. Victims and their families should be at the centre of the criminal justice system, and the current system of sentencing fails to put them there. This bill may increase the confusion about sentencing, however, as Victim Support Scotland noted in their submission. Ending automatic early release for only some categories of prisoners would work to further complicate an already confusing system. The proposals would, in fact, create another rule that needs to be taken into account when calculating the release date of an offender. The introduction of the Scottish Sentencing Council was an important development in this regard. After a recommendation by the Scottish Sentencing Committee, which used to advise the Scottish Government on its approach to punishment and sentencing, the Scottish Sentencing Council was set up by the Criminal Justice and Licence in Scotland Act 2010. Its stated aim is to foster greater consistency and transparency in the decisions of the courts by the creation of an appropriate framework to promote fairness and justice in sentencing. Its statutory objectives are to promote consistency in sentencing practice, assist the development of policy in relation to sentencing, promote greater awareness and understanding of sentencing policy and practice. These are all laudable and sensible objectives. I welcome the position indicated by Lord Carloway, the Chair of the Council, that it will seek to take an evidence-based approach to sentencing. I'm also pleased that it will have re reserve a position for victims' representatives. It is important that the Scottish people have confidence in the court system and the punishments it apportions to offenders. It is also important that we commit ourselves to doing what works. The Sentencing Council will provide an opportunity for a wider range of voices to be heard in the sentencing process and make clearer to the general public the principles and policies that motivate our judges, sheriffs, stipendiary magistrates and justice of the peace when deciding on disposals. These are all important tasks. It's surprising and worrying, therefore, that the Scottish Government has dragged its feet for almost five years on setting up the Sentencing Council. The clarity and certainty on sentencing that the Sentencing Council will provide is desirable and necessary now. The provisions in section 2 of the bill to allow prisoners due to be released on Fridays two day, is, is to be released two days earlier in order to increase the provision of support for them is a good one. It may appear to some as a small change, but according to the Scottish Prison Service, around 4,000 prisoners are released every year on Fridays. They emerge at the weekends with limited support. We do too little to help offenders back into the community once they have served their time, and this modest proposal will at least make some provision to increase the support and guidance that they receive. At the heart of any structure surrounding the release of prisoners must be the calculation of risk to public safety. This is notoriously difficult to calculate and it would be wholly unreasonable for us to expect the relevant authorities to successfully calculate the risk of re-offending every time they are called up to do so. But we must ensure that each offender's risk profile is central to the debate as to whether they are released early or not. For those who commit serious offences, it should not be an automatic process. I agree with Victim Support Scotland and Police Scotland who have indicated that they support the essence of the proposals as they will encourage relevant prisoners to engage with prison rehabilitation programmes and ensure that those prisoners assessed as still posing a high risk do not benefit from early release. I also agree with the Howard League and other experts who noted that an unintended consequence of the bill would be that prisoners are released cold into the community without a period of supervision from relevant authorities. 
As the Howard League put it in their submission, the current proposal fails to recognise the strong evidence that, supports, that support and supervision in the community is more effective in reducing reoffending rates than time spent in custody. An abrupt and unsupported transition of a prisoner from the structured environment of prison to non-parole release may in many instances result in, in a reversion to pre-sentence behaviour. To mitigate this problem, some have suggested the extension of the MAPA approach to violent offenders. This is an interesting proposal, but it's not good enough that we have no concrete plan on this. We are talking about some of the most serious offenders in Scotland's prisons. We need more specificity when discussing their rehabilitation. There is more vagueness than just the content of the supervision. How long will there need to be supervision, and will it be pre- or post-release? Moreover, why has the Scottish Government produced a human rights impact statement accompanying this bill that the Scottish Human Rights Commission has described as simply not adequate? This, coupled with the aforementioned, va aforementioned vagueness, means that offenders who have been refused release could have a human rights challenge if they have not been offered the necessary rehabilitation programmes. I hope the Scottish Government ensures that these comments are addressed as the bill is taken forward now. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Christian Allard to be followed by Alison McInnes. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, um, first of all, I would like to thank the other committee members and all the organisation individuals who came and gave evidence. Uh, it was uh, uh, a long, long session, and it was a, uh, a great work on the, the chair of, uh, of our chair. And I think it, it was very interesting to see how much uh, the committee did influence uh, what happened thereafter and influence the decision of the cabinet secretary. Um, in fact, it was the uh, individuals and the organisation who came uh, and gave evidence who changed the report and made the report for what it is, more than us, the members, maybe. Uh, the committee did support the general principle of the bill, of course, and you are stage one. As the Cabinet Secretary said in his letter to the Convener on the 3rd of February this year, this bill provides a step towards achieving the aim to end the current system of automatic early release of prisoners, brought in by the then UK government in 1993. John Major's Conservative government brought in automatic early release to tackle concerns about prison overcrowding. Under a Tory government, criminals were let out of prison after serving only half of a sentence, no <coughs> question asked. An admission of, um, of many failures, if, if, if there were one, uh, sending too many people to prison, failing to accommodate them, failing to, re to release them under supervision. And it's what uh, this government wants to uh, uh, to, to address, uh, particularly the cold release uh, that have been introduced under this, uh, the Conservative government in 1933, this SNP government is taking the first step to end automatic early release because it's, of course, the first step. This is about the right of prisoners to be supported when coming out of prison, the right of families of victims to know that offenders should be assessed before being released. Uh, this bill is about public safety. Public safety is not only at the core of Section 1 of this bill, but also in Section 2. Uh, Section 2 will provide the Scottish Prison Service the power to release prisoners up to two days early to facilitate community reintegration. How important is this, uh, President Officer? We found that uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the evidence that we receive, that is in fact very, very important. A couple of days can make a lot of difference. A prisoner is released over the weekend, uh, cannot access services, can maybe not uh, have a place to stay, uh, and it's so important that we uh, make it as easy as possible uh, for uh, these uh, prisoners. And it's a lot of prisoners because it's all prisoners serving more than 15 days. So it's quite a, a, a huge remit, and it will make uh, a, a lot of difference. And in fact, it's quite common sense, and I wonder why we didn't introduce it before. Section 2 of the bills deals with the last few days uh, uh, before release, but Section 1 leaves the last few weeks, the last few months, in the same spirit of Section 1. It's supporting prisoners when released, recognising the right of families of victims and improving public safety. In his letter again, in February, the Cabinet Secretary confirmed to our committee that it was the Scottish Government's intention to bring forward amendments at Stage 2 of the Bill to extend the provisions of Section 1 of the Bill and to end automatic release for all long-term prisoners regardless of category. Let us be clear about this. The quality of the evidence we received helped the approach of the Cabinet Secretary 
to amend this bill at stage two. I note Alan Murray uh, com uh, commended the Cabinet Secretary for his approach, and I would like to add to it uh, that the pragmatism of the Cabinet Secretary is to be applauded. He recognised that this first step uh, towards ending automatic early release of prisoners was too small, and is acting upon it by extending the limit of this bill to all long-term prisoners. Uh, in paragraph 45 of the report, witnesses did tell us that prisoners might still be released in the community without mandatory supervision, what is referred and what some members referred already as called release. Uh, in par paragraph 46, uh, Professor Tata from the University of Strathclyde uh, describes the issues in the following terms. He said, we need to explain to members of the public that eventually prisoners have to come out and that if someone is released cold, they are more likely to re-offend. This is an important point, important point and uh, let me thank Professor Tata for his contribution. He was one of the strong voices who highlighted to committee members uh, of the danger of the bill not eradicating all cases of, co of cold release. Another point was made uh, by Peter Johnson as well. Uh, well, another point from Professor Tata uh, uh, when he talked about uh, what the changes could be. He did say that effective reintegration is a prerequisite for public safety, and I do uh, more than agree with uh, Professor Tata on this. Uh, regarding Pete, uh, Peter Johnson's contribution of the Risk Management Authority, uh, regarding the power of the, of the parole board and how much the parole board can make a difference. He said that the parole board has huge expertise in looking at the risk that the risk of offenders uh, present today. Because uh, I'm delighted that stage two amendments will cover all these important concerns because, presiding officer, we have been here before. In the last brief, the Law Society of Scotland who welcomed the publication of our report, pointed out the shortcomings of previous, legis previous legislation, the Custodial uh, Sentences and Weapons Scotland Act 2007. The Law Society is right. The parts of the Act relating to sentencing have not yet come into force seven years after the Act was passed. The reason is simple, President Officer, the expectation of the hack might have been too high, uh, and they were so high, but it soon became apparent, apparent that it was not possible to implement them. Like Jen Baxter said, we are where we are, and uh, we, we, we've got to move on. I think we have learned our lessons, the lessons of the past. The pragmatism of this bill has to be commended. Yes, of course. Mr. Ferguson. I'm sorry to interrupt the member, but my reading of what the Law Society have said to members in briefings is not that there was inadequacy in the 2007 Act, but simply that if this Act, if, um, if unamended, were to go through and the 2007 Act were to be enacted, there would then be contradiction. That's not the same as the, minister, the member has just said. But that but, but was my interpretation of what they're saying. And what, what I was saying is that uh, uh, it's, all, it's all down to implementation. If there is a problem for the government to implement it, you know, the, the Act is, is not fit for purpose. But as Jen Bax says there, we, we, are, we are not there yet and we've got to move on. Uh, and, and, and we learn from, from the past. Uh, the President's control of the Scotland Bill is dealing with the back end of our ju ju judicial system, dealing with a few days the last few weeks and the last few months before release. This is where we should start. This is the first step. Then we can work on ending automatic release for all prisoners and on sentencing. Or we might decide that the second step, the second step should be to deal with uh, the front end of our judicial system, which is sentencing. I know we heard different views on the matters and we heard them uh, this afternoon. Uh, but let me be clear, I think this bill is not is what it's all about, uh, but in, in, uh, in future bills, I think we should, we should see that uh, sentencing should be definitely more transparent and we should ma make improvement on this. Uh, one thing I was very surprised uh, at committee, it's the reaction of Margaret Mitchell, who did dissent uh, from supporting the general principle of the bids. Uh, I didn't know today that she said that, uh, and, and I didn't Roger welcome close, please. Uh, the fact that uh, the conservative uh, the Scottish Conservatives were going to abstain. However, to conclude, President Officer, our stage one report reflects that prisoners should be supported where coming out of prison. Families of victims have the right to know that offenders should be assessed before being released. It's what the victim supports Scotland told us what they want. President Officer, this bill is about public safety and I'm looking forward to stage two. President Officer. Thank you very much. I now call on Alison McInnes to be followed by Gil Patterson. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer, and I apologise to members in advance. I have a sore throat. Um, if automatic early release for long-term prisoners is to be abolished, the alternative must pass three tests, three key tests. 
One, the risk posed by an individual must determine the proportion of the sentence they serve in prison. Two, it must prioritise public safety. And three, it must guarantee supervision and support upon release. The bill, as it lies before us today at stage one, fails the last two of these tests and it is fundamentally flawed. Once again, this Justice Secretary has had to pick up the pieces and promise an overhaul of his predecessor's ill-considered plans. And as witnesses commented to us, to us on committee, um, making significant government amendments at stage two is hardly best practice. However, in this instance, I do agree that the Cabinet Secretary's proposals outlined to the committee are an improvement and allow us to support this at stage one today. So ending automatic early release for all those serving sentences in excess of four years is more coherent with the evidence on risk and reoffending rates. Widening the scope of the bill so all long-term prisoners are subject to a period of compulsory supervision in the community is equally important. There was genuine concern that the current bill <coughs> excuse me, would fail those whom the parole board deemed necessary to serve their full sentences. The Parliament's Independent Information Service, SPICE, concluded in a quote, the period of supervision in the community under licence conditions could be reduced potentially to zero. Victims organisations, the Scottish Human Rights Commission and many more warned of the risks to the public and increased reoffending, defeating the, object, the objective of the policy. Some of the analysis was scathing. Dr Monica Barry feared the most potentially high-risk people leaving prison with no support. Howard League Scotland said it would lead to prisoners being spat out of prison. It was even suggested some prisoners would seek to max out their sentences so as to avoid restrictions upon release. As Jane Baxter said, MAPA and extended sentencing arrangements, if used as fragmented workarounds, wouldn't sufficiently ensure someone can't walk free completely unsupervised. And that's why a minimum guarantee needs to be on the face of the bill, and I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's assurance that it will be. Some people will legitimately ask whether post-sentence end controls, a mandatory control period, is automatic early release in all but name. It will be factored into sentencing decisions, and perhaps the Cabinet Secretary will address this concern in closing. But I'm minded to agree so-called end controls should last a minimum of six months, but I'm also open to the possibility of their lasting nine months. I can also confirm Scottish Liberal Democrats wholeheartedly support Section 2 of the Bill. It's entirely sensible for prisoners to be released just a day or two early if it means they get the support they desperately need to successfully return to the community. Public and third sector services simply aren't available 24-7. Housing, social work, employment. In 2011-12, 40% of prisoners, some 4,000 people, were released on a Friday or just before a long public holiday weekend. This measure is a small change that could make a big difference during the transition. It's a small change that could dram dramatically reduce the likelihood of thousands of people reoffending and causing any further harm. In the short time I have remaining, I'd like to highlight some other outstanding issues. The revised proposals will, of course, have resource implications for the prison service. Each year, 450 more people will receive sentences under the terms of which they aren't eligible for early release. And before the categories were extended, it was anticipated to be about 140. So in addition to the general costs of accommodating more prisoners, there will be increased demand for purposeful activity and programmes which address the underlying causes of offending behaviour. Excuse me. However, I note the Cabinet Secretary has not explicitly committed to bringing forward supplementary policy and financial uh, memorandums as the committee requested, and I do urge him to do so. We need to carefully consider the additional costs and demands. President officer, there is public appetite for greater clarity and transparency in the meaning of sentencing. I wouldn't blame the public for thinking we were talking in riddles when discussing the various release options automatic and unsupervised, automatic and supervised, discretionary and supervised. Victims and witnesses are often bemused or even angered by stories of serious offenders being automatically released partway through the sentence handed to them by the Sheriff or the High Court, regardless of any assessment of whether they continue to pose a threat. This feeling is understandably intensified in high-profile cases or if the individual proceeds to reoffend. This bill could help begin to enhance understanding and public confidence. However, I think it could have been informed by the Scottish Sentencing Council's work. Improving policy, practice and understanding of sentencing is squarely within its remit. But five years after this Parliament legislated, it's still not up and running. 
and the body could have played a role in considering how best to manage early release. Indeed, there is a risk that this bill is being progressed in isolation. Other long overdue reforms and apparent shared aspirations have stalled. The commencement of the early release provisions already backed by this Parliament through the 2007 Custodial Sentences and Weapons Act, reducing the bloated prison population, ending senseless short-term sentences and shifting the focus of sentencing from punishment to rehabilitation. I think this short bill is there for another example of a piecemeal approach to penal reform. Scottish Liberal Democrats are clear, while this legislation is set to be improved and we will support it on that basis, Justice policy should also be, always be complementary and guided by the evidence of what works and not quick pursuit of cheap headlines. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And thank you. And I now call on Gil Patterson to be followed by Margaret McDougall. A generous six minutes. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to take part in this debate as a member of the Justice Committee. The end of early release for prisoners is seen by a large cross-section of the public to be very important a very important issue which we can, uh, can relate to in regards to their own safety within the community they live in. I, I want to acknowledge that the evidence to the Justice Committee uh, uh, and the fact that Michael Matheson, uh, MSP Cabinet Secretary of Justice, extended the provision in the bill to cover all long-term prisoners, which is to his credit and to the Scottish Government's credit. Uh, he has shown uh, leadership uh, on, on this regard by listening to reasoned argument and, accord and uh, responding accordingly. Uh, that's a good thing in, in my book, when governments and ministers listen and perhaps uh, come to a different conclusion from their, their former conclusion. Uh, during this contribution, I will aim to focus on those prisoners who committed serious sex offences and how this legis legislation will impact on them and offer some comfort to their victims. As a former board member of Rape Crisis Central Scotland, this is an aspect of crime that I am sadly fam familiar uh, with through working on behalf of the victims of sexual assault. Many people in Scotland have never understood why serious sexual offenders were automatically released before they had served their full sentence. Those who were the victims of these offences are petrified at the thought of the person who had attacked them in what they understandably believe is the ultimate crime, being released early, and that they live with, with the fear of one day being confronted by their attacker. That said, in regards to what many of the public think on early release, and uh, particularly the large number of those who were victims who are in disagreement with the present system. Nonetheless, I am in full support of the parole board uh, making the final decision on whether serious sex offenders should be released before completing their sentence. The parole board have the benefit of knowing how the rehabilitation programmes have worked on the individual. I am particularly supportive of the work carried out in Peterhead Prison. It has introduced programmes designed to change the behaviour of sex, uh, serious sex offenders and the work undertaken has had a tremendous record of success. Now, I wonder if that is actually the reason of why people tend not to re-offend re because of the work that's carried out in that institution. Now, I acknowledge that prisoners volunteer for these programmes for a whole host of reasons. Some volunteer in order to influence the parole board to show them that they are putting some effort into changing their, be their behaviour in the hope that they are rewarded by being granted early release. There are, however, many prisoners uh, who volunteer because they sincerely believe that they need help and that they need to change their behaviour to better themselves, certainly, society and to ensure that they never are sent back to prison. No matter the, mo the motivation for changing behaviour, we can see the success of this form of system by acknowledging that someone cold released and, automatic and, and automatically uh, released is approximately seven times more likely to breach their, their licence conditions than someone released after a decision taken by the par parole board. 
and with uh, some of the, the programmes in place. So for those victims and for members of the public who have been fearful of early release and the impact that it will have on them and their communities, I would offer this message. What is being proposed by the Scottish Government should give some comfort in knowing that very well tried, tested and effective rehabilitation courses will be available to those offenders while serving their time in prison. And they are indeed very effective. Further to that, supervision is a, in the community will also be in place whether or not prisoners participate in rehabilitation within the prison. For me, I would far rather have a par parole board after a deliberation and detailed reports to grant error release to someone who may have, let's say, one year left of their sentence, knowing that they are unlikely to reoffend based on the behaviour programmes and the assessment by the parole board, and I hope this should be some comfort to the public. This is where rehabilitation plays such an important role, and of course the work of the parole boards themselves, uh, mentioned by Roderick Campbell uh, earlier on in his contribution. Although I have focused primarily on those who have been imprisoned for serious sex offences, I would argue that the same balanced view, uh, viewpoint will work across uh, all crimes. The bill goes some way to ensuring that the end of early release for all long-term prisoners will have public safety and the need for effective rehabilitation and supervision at the heart of it. I would like to say just a few words about uh, Section 2. I find uh, that the Section 2 is just plain common sense the idea that you would send people out that are really need uh, some help to not reoffend in that fashion, knowing that the services are not available, I think was, was wrong in the first place. So this is just a simple common sense change, and I welcome that. I think it will have a big effect in people uh, when they're released and in the long run help them and society uh, 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 just get uh, a better a, a better understanding of how things work uh, early. Uh, work is still need, needing to uh, be done through stage two at committee, committee level, but I feel we are more than on the right track, and I commend this bill to the Parliament today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Margaret McDougall to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Hiding officer. As we've heard in the Chamber today, the bill presented before us, which proposes to end automatic early re release for sex offenders serving four years or more and others serving ten years or more, is likely to be substantially amended by the Scottish Government at stage two. Because if this bill was to be passed in its current form, it would only affect 1% of prisoners in Scotland. The Scottish Government's proposed amendments would end automatic early release for all long-term prisoners serving four years or more, which equates to only 3% of the 7,851 people who made up Scotland's prison population on average in 2013-14. This, as we have heard today, relates greater concerns about the sentencing policy and process within Scotland. Scottish Labour agrees with victim support groups that there needs to be clarity in sentencing. Victims, the community and offenders need to understand what the sentence passed by the judge or sheriff actually means in practice. This bill does not go far enough in achieving the same. The amendments will also introduce a mandatory period of supervision after release. At this stage, however, the period of supervision is undefined within the bill. Furthermore, we do not know if this period will be part of the issued sentence or will be added on at the end of the custodial sentence. It would be helpful if the Scottish Government could clarify this point as a matter of urgency. The second part of the bill, which, like others in the Chamber, I welcome, would ensure that offenders due to be released on a Friday could be released up to two days earlier to ensure that proper care and support is in place before the weekend. 
This should improve transition from prison back into the community because currently, if someone was due to be released on a Friday, the proper care and support, like social services, uh, housing, would not be in place, and this can and does lead to issues. Given these substantial amendments, both the financial and policy memorandums will need to be rewritten. The SPICE document on the bill originally estimated that the eventual long-term impact would be to increase the average daily prison population by approximately 140. I would expect this figure to increase as the number of those affected using 2012-13 figures stood at 131 offenders. The amendments would see it affect 473 against figures based on 2012-13. It is also expected that there would be an increase in demand for prisoner programmes to reflect the fact that an early release for relevant prisoners would be based on an assessment of risk to the public. With this in mind, we must ensure that adequate rehabilitation services are in place, as the Howard League for Penal Reform in Scotland state that it is necessary for the Scottish Prison Service to provide sufficient rehabilitation services to allow prisoners to reduce their risk of reoffending and harm. Where such services are not available, continued detention may become arbitrary and in breach of Article 5 of the European Convention of Human Rights. Offenders who have been refused release could have a human rights challenge if they have not been offered the necessary rehabilitation programmes, and we certainly agree, I think, across the Chamber that we should avoid this. Some of these changes will put additional strain on the prison system if proper resources are not made available. And indeed, during his evidence to the Justice Committee, Professor Alan Miller of Scottish Human Rights Commission stated that, you have heard from witnesses that the resources within and out with prisons are not seen as being adequate. The legislation will increase the spotlight on whether resources are adequate. To conclude, presiding officer, given that the bill is due to go through substantial amendments, it's difficult to discuss the full impact of the bill while we currently do not know the full projected costs and effects of the amendments. However, Scottish Labour will be supporting this bill at stage one. Despite the fact it fails to address sentencing policy and reconviction. It is a start. I hope the Scottish Government will ensure that prison and parole boards are properly resourced, ensure that adequate rehabilitation services are in place and that they can meet the future demand. Thank you. Thank you. Now call on Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Christina McKelvey, a generous six minutes. Officer, and I very much welcome the opportunity to speak on this important subject today. We all know that the uh, control of the release of prisoners is uh, a subject which has been needing addressing for some time. Uh, I had the privilege to serve as the Shadow Justice Minister in Session 2, um, Shadow Deputy Justice Minister in Session 2, uh, with special responsibility for prisons. So I ended up visiting a lot of prisons, um, Socht and Inverness, uh, Peterhead, of course, in my constituency. I, I was in more often than I would wish to be. I uh, visited a prison in Wales, a prison in France, and I met, uh, when I was across there, the Justice Minister in uh, Georgia and talked to him about prison policies there. And it's clear there is a wide range of approach that different jurisdictions take. It's also very clear that we need to be very careful about some broad brush assumptions that we perhaps have been making in the assumption. And the first and obvious thing to say is each prisoner is an individual and we need to be very careful to look at each prisoner as an individual. And that's why it's important that the patrol parole board is particularly well resourced on the back of the reforms that we're looking at. Uh, the figures that are provided in the, um, in the memoranda that come with the bill uh, say that for the parole board, um, by 
2029. OK, that's a fair distance out. And the number of cases they'll be dealing with will rise by some 230. So we need to make sure that we have the resources in place to do that. Now, we've been talking quite a lot about sex offenders, and I think it's probably important to remind ourselves there are two kinds of sex offenders. There are those who are essentially violent criminals who express their violence by sexual offences, by rape, violence in a sexual relationship. And the more insidious one is, of course, the paedophiles and those who groom uh, people that they're going to subject to sexual abuse. We say that reoffending and that is uh, in, the, in sex offenders is lower, and that is factually correct. But we mustn't confuse that with re of, uh, reconviction is lower, but reoffending may or may not be lower, because it is substantially more difficult to detect many sexual offences. So I think where sexual offenders are concerned, we have to be particularly careful, make sure that the parole board and others are resourced well uh, to deal with that particular category of offender. And of course, the average IQ of a paedophile is a, a bit higher than the average IQ of somebody who's in prison for other offenses. They are more cunning, they are more dangerous, and they carry greater risk, and we need to be careful uh, that we address that. Now, I have confidence we will do that, confidence in the prison service, confidence that, that, that we in this parliament uh, would wish to, uh, to do that. At the end of the day, our objectives here uh, in dealing with people who are serious offenders are threefold. Uh, we have the element of retribution, um, giving uh, back to the person who is offended a real sense of the opprobrium that comes from their having committed an offence against another member of uh, society. And the person who's been uh, subject to that offence would certainly wish to see that, and that's right and proper. Rehabilitation. And we've talked quite a lot about rehabilitation. The reality is rehabilitation is the moral thing for us to be doing, but it is also an economic thing for us to be doing, because it's very expensive to put people in prison. We know that. So every time we effectively turn someone's life around and stop them coming back to prison, there's a huge economic benefit. And the thing I haven't heard mentioned, but has been mentioned in other justice debates in the past, is restitution. Now, that's a relatively limited thing, but uh, my mother-in-law, who had her purse, uh, stolen, for example, the courts imposed on the two individuals who'd been responsible for stealing her purse that they had to repay the money. And that's a proper part of sentencing policy. And we've got to be uh, very flexible and have the ability in our judges when they're sentencing to flexibly look at the circumstances uh, and apply them properly. Now, not all prisoners get it. One of the visits I made as uh, uh, Shadow Deputy Justice Minister was to Stockton Prison. And I found myself in a cell with six lifers who were in there for murder. Uh, the prison chaplain was on the open door so he could summon uh, the staff if things got uh, too heated. And one of the uh, uh, offenders there put it to me that he had been released on license and he had been recalled. And in his view, entirely unjustified. It, it was just because he happened to be with a group of people uh, when another murder took place. He had nothing to do with the murder, he just happened to be there. And, you know, when you deal with prisoners whose attitude is thus, you realise that it's impossible in the nature of things to get it right all the time. Because I didn't feel uncomfortable about that recall, and I don't think many people uh, would do so. But uh, the important thing about this bill is that it does restore, perhaps, confidence in public view of how sentencing works. It takes the first steps. Um, we've got to get the whole road in due course. Uh, we've got to make sure uh, that we have the resources when people come out. We've got to make sure that the new arrangements for access to health, housing and other services are there for prisoners. I was very impressed by Sockton when I visited them a few years ago. Peter Head, uh, with a very different category of prisoners, um, did its own thing. And the new HMP Grampian uh, has a very good approach that they have in plan to work with prisoners. We now have young offenders, we have women prisoners, and we have a more general prison population. The first time we put them all on one campus, expensive to do, but even more expensive not to do properly. I think uh, I very much look forward to working with uh, HMP Grampian because it's going to be more challenging for the community 
to actually have to interact with prisoners as they adjust to going back out than it used to be when we had all Scotland's serious sex offenders locked behind the walls, entirely disconnected and discharged back to communities elsewhere. But I think that's a price worth paying, and I'm sure the staff in the prison service will do well with that new facility. What happens at HMP Grampian will inform what should happen elsewhere. It will lead to improvements in our programmes. It will lead to improvements in outcomes. This bill is a good, useful one-page bill which takes us forward on the kind of road uh, that we need to be travelling. I congratulate the Minister and the Government uh, for the progress they've made, but I and others will properly continue to challenge the Government to do substantially more uh, when we're able to do so. Presiding Officer. Many thanks. I now call on Christina McKelvey to be followed by Patricia Ferguson. Generous six minutes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm not or ever have been a member of the Justice Committee of this Parliament, but I was looking back over the eight years that I've spent here and the uh, number of uh, justice-related debates that I've taken part in, and they've usually always came from a very personal, if not a professional, interest in the work that the Justice Committee does. Um, certainly, it's important work that we all um, expect to be done because we want to be living in a safer society. My uh, background in social work took me to uh, many, many um, households and local area teams and support groups and support centres where I've seen some amazing work going on. And when you see people who have been in some cases, possibly a victim of the justice system and as much as how they ended up there and how they are rehabilitated out the other end. You can't but stop to realise the fantastic work that has been done by the professionals in that field. And what they need is every, every tool in the toolbox to help them to do that. And I have said it before, but I'll say it again. I think the safety of our public has to be an absolute priority. But the rehabilitation and the support for people who have been through the justice system is just as important to building that safe society that we all want. But the question is, how best do we achieve that result? And I know that it's not going to be done in one great leap. And certainly the number of debates that I've taken part in which are probably a drop in the ocean compared to some others in this chamber, um, are a way to highlight some of that. But this bill in particular, I think, takes us a small but important step forward. One of my interests as a co-convener of the cross-party group in men's violence against women is obviously what happens to people who are victims of domestic violence or sexual abuse. And you might see convicted criminal being sentenced up for 10 years, for instance, his victim heaves a sigh of relief. She, and in most likely cases it is a she, will be well aware that the likelihood of that perpetrator being early released and that person not knowing about it is very, very likely indeed. One of the pilots that I supported, and I'm very, very happy that the Scottish Government have taken it forward as the Clare's Law pilot, which allows someone who has suspicions about a partner to get the information they need. These are important ways of providing people with relevant inf information where appropriate. There is questions about transparency, and I see that transparency and clarity are a key theme within the Stage 1 report, um, and people's rights, you know, and obviously some prisoners' rights have to be um, transparent and given clarity to. These are two sides of the same coin, in my opinion. Knowing what the real rather than the theoretical outcome is going to be is just as important to the prisoners as it is to the victims. And transparency, in my opinion, is a hallmark of this government. We live and operate in a real world rather than between the gated entrance of Downing Street, for instance. This bill is a move towards greater transparency. Rather than the vague assumptions about early release, it will introduce 
proper controls that will improve the system by allowing decisions about when and how people are released to be the most important element. These decisions will be taken and informed by the individual consideration of a prisoner, taking into account public safety and the need for effective supervision. In this way, it addresses both sides of that coin. It ensures that dangerous prisoners do not get released automatically while bringing in a mandatory period of control through supervision for all long-term prisoners leaving custody. I have to say that long-term support and control is something that I absolutely agree with. And I suppose it will always be something of a balancing act to do this successfully. And working with some of the criminal justice social workers that I spent some time with, then sometimes that judgment call is a different, difficult judgment call to make. And that's why, as I said in my open remarks, they need the best tools at their, their uh, hand to do that. And we're not thinking about petty criminals here, people on three or four month sentences, but we're talking about people serving much longer jail terms and the fact that they actually should be remaining in that jail for the sentence they have been given. No prisoner serving time for serious offences would be automatically released in the licence after two thirds for the sentence, for instance. We already know that a prisoner on automatic release is seven times more likely to breach their licence condition than someone released after a decision by a parole board. The reason is obvious. When individual consideration is applied, people are likely to respond more positively. When the government decided to close down Cottonville Women's Prison, this was one of the realities that the Cabinet Secretary recognised. Prison of itself isn't curative. What works is small units like the 218 Centre, where women prisoners are managed in a far more constructive way. While by far the majority of women in prison are there for minor offences, women can and do commit violent crime and should be protected, should, the society should be protected from them. In Dame Ailish Angelini's report, she pointed out that on the issue that women commit different types of crimes for distinctly different reasons, drug abuse, a dysfunctional or deprived family background, being victims of violence themselves and sometimes confused desperation, all colour or motives. She pointed out that while the proportions of the male and female population in prisons for violent offences are similar, about 35% as of the 30th of June, proportionally more women are in prison for other crimes. The current system, for me a bit like Westminster, isn't working for Scotland, but we have the foresight and the intelligence here to see ways of better managing criminals, all of which indicates how right Dame Eilish is in her recommendations. So why am I talking about the women's prison? Well, I think the recommendations from Dame Eilish's report could apply across the board and that one-stop one shops like 218 or the Willow Project model can be used across the board to deal with all prisoners. I believe there is scope to develop that idea across the entire prison regime and I would hope the Cabinet Secretary would think about that. And using support services like those described, the more clarity called for in the, the Stage 1 report on release arrangements can only help to ensure that we reduce reoffending and we give the professionals in, the teams, the tools to do the job properly. We know that victim support has called for a bit more clarity and I'm sure that's something that the Cabinet Secretary will step up to. Mm -hmm. But, Presiding Officer, in closing, it is clear that the Government wants to move forward with innovative responses. It's clear this Chamber wants to move forward with those responses to seek out a more effective and meaningful way forward than the current system can offer. And that can only be good for us all. Many thanks. Appreciate that. I now call on Patricia Ferguson to be followed by Claire Adamson. A generous six minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As someone who is not a member of the Justice Committee and therefore not as familiar with the systems and processes involved in our application of criminal justice, it has always seemed to me that the sentencing of those convicted of crimes is an area where greater clarity is needed and where more work to explain the system is needed. And nowhere has this been more the case over the years than in the debates that there have been about ending automatic early release. I had hoped that the reforms that we had been promised by the Scottish Government 
would help to provide clarity to do that, but my reading of the bill and the report by the Justice Committee would suggest that this is not the case and that the proposals in the bill do not go far enough, in my view, to provide protection to our communities. And I say that because I'm speaking about the bill as we have it in front of us at the moment. But we really are in a rather strange position today when we are having a debate about stage one of a bill which will actually be fundamentally different by the time it emerges from the stage two consideration. And having said that, I very much applaud the Cabinet Secretary for being willing to bring forward the amendments that he has laid out today, because I think they will help to make the situation better and to make it more clear. And I really am uh, sorry that he has found himself in a position where that has been necessary. I'm sure it's not a problem of his making, but it's one that he seems to be uh, certainly stepping up to the plate in trying to resolve but it seems to me that we are only looking at one part of the system in this bill, certainly as it stands, the end point when a prisoner is released. But we also need to look at the situation at the point at which the prisoner is sentenced to ensure that our sentencing policy itself is correct and is transparent. And the fact that the Sentencing Council legislated for in 2010 will not begin its work until the last quarter of this year, seems to me to be wrong. It would surely have been better to allow the policy proposals contained in this bill to be part of a comprehensive package of measures that could have been influenced by the Sentencing Council. Now, that's not to say that I'm suggesting there should be a delay in putting forward these provisions, but I do think that they would have been all the better for having had the benefit of having been considered by a sentencing council that had been introduced prior to this point. And indeed, the Law Society, in its briefing to members, makes the very valid point that the most significant, and I think they and indeed Margaret Mitchell said, uh, the most radical change to custodial sentencing policy in over 20 years will be introduced by way of a stage two amendment to a bill already before Parliament. The Law Society contrasts that with the situation in 1993 when significant changes were last made. And at that time, as we know, the changes were only made after the careful consideration of two reports on the matter, one of which had had the benefit of 14 months of consideration and much discussion within the legal profession and elsewhere. Presiding officer, happy to. Uh, thank Christine you. Graham. Would, the, would the member accept, however, that the Justice Committee will have the opportunity, if it so wishes, to take evidence on what might be substantial amendments at stage two, and that the Law Society, among, amongst others, have the opportunity to challenge those amendments? I absolutely accept that point, but I still make the point that it is actually quite a strange way to be legislating. We should really have had the materials in front, or the committee should have had, and Parliament should have had those materials at stage one if it was to do the kind of job that we all expect it to do. Now, I have no um, hesitation in saying that I know that the, the committee, the Justice Committee, under the convenership of Christine, uh, uh, sorry, Christine Graham, will do a fantastic job in doing that, but it should not be having to do it in that way. Victims and communities presiding officer need to know that if a sentence of four years is handed down that the prisoner will be in prison and that communities will be protected from that individual for that length of time. And in this point I do not disagree at all with the Scottish Government. But victims and communities also need to know that when the person is released from prison that everything possible has been done and will continue to be done to prevent that person from re-offending. This bill must put in place systems to help to manage the transition that every prisoner has to make back into their community at the end of a sentence that they will have served in full. And the offender too has to leave prison equipped with enough skill and self-awareness to be able with support to find a productive role in society once again. Now, I acknowledge entirely that that is the difficult part. Rehabilitation is not easy, but it mustn't be seen as an add-on, but as an essential part of a successful justice system. And if rehabilitation is to work, it must surely continue as tailored support when a prisoner is released. 
Now, I congratulate the Justice Committee for its work in this bill and for its carefully considered report. And they were right to ask for clarification of the Scottish Government's intentions. And they are also right to want to know what the minimum period of supervision upon release will be and that any guaranteed minimum period should be sufficient to allow effective post-release work with the offender to take place. And this too must be accompanied, in my view, by continuous risk assessment. The Cabinet Secretary in his opening uh, comments quite understandably asked for views um, about the length of that mandatory period. Um, clearly, he's still considering that, and that's to be welcomed. My own view would be that surely this must depend on the nature of the crime and the proportion uh, and must be proportionate to, to the sentence. I am not sure that we can say that six months or nine months is right. I think, and perhaps the Justice Committee's evidence will prove me wrong, and I'm happy to be proved wrong in this one, um, that it should really be tailored to the individual and the pattern of their offending and the sentence that they have served. But time will tell what the outcome of those deliberations are. Of course, as we've heard, continuous monitoring will bring additional pressure to bear in the parole service and in other community-based services. And the question of how they are to be resourced must be properly addressed. And the committee is right to press for a supplementary financial memorandum in that regard and also an updated policy mem memorandum too. With regard to the prospect of allowing release to take place up to two days earlier to avoid a clash with the weekends, that to me makes absolutely perfect sense. I'm sure like many members, I've had phone calls, uh, not just on a Friday, but also earlier in the week from people who are being or have been released from prison. And I've had letters in advance too, and who are looking for support because they are worried about what will happen to them when they are released and about the effect that might have on their behaviour. So that's an aspect of the bill, presiding officer, that I very much welcome. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I now call on Claire Adamson to be followed by John Finney. Presiding officer, um, I'd like to just note that um, the decisions that we make um, as this bill, bill goes forward in the Parliament um, will also affect our prison communities. A prison community is much more than just the prisoners, the staff, wardens, support and counselling services all form part of, of that community and any changes that we make with this bill must ensure that no damage is done to the community cohesion within our prisons. Long term safety to the public and the public service workers must be paramount as this moves forward. Presiding officer, I am not a member of the Justice Committee but I have listened to the debate with interest this afternoon. I don't have a professional background in this area, although I did serve as a substitute member in the Community Justice Authority in Lanarkshire and as such was familiar with MAPA regulations. But I am convinced that the safety of the public is the absolute priority of this government and that as prog has, progress has been made in recent years. This reform will ensure that no long-term prisoner will in future be eligible for automatic release after just two-thirds of their sentence. I believe that the bill will improve the system of early release by allowing decisions about when and how people are released from prison to be taken in informed individual consideration of the prisoner and public safety and the need for effective supervision of that prisoner. I think that ensuring dangerous prisoners do not get released automatically while ensuring mandatory period of control through supervision of all long-term prisoners leaving custodies will be achieved by this bill. I also think that we will improve the system of area release by allowing decisions about when and how people are released from prison to be taken in an informed manner. And I think it's been well spoken of this afternoon that section two of the bill should achieve that no one actually has um, what's been termed cold release. This has, can't be taken in isolation of previous reports, previous bills and what's been happening. But I do believe that um, eventually, as was stated in the 2008 report of the Independent McLeish Prisons Commission, fundamental changes to the operation of the current system of early release can only be taken once prison numbers are established at a longer term, lower trend level, so that capacity within the prison estate is available to deal with short to medium term impact of making changes to the early release system. 
And we have to take this in the context that recorded crime has fallen for the seventh year in a row and is now at a 40-year low. And we continue to maintain, this government continues to maintain its commitment to 1,000 extra police officers tackling crime in our communities. Many people have spoken this afternoon about rehabilitation programmes and ensuring that they are available and that they are properly funded. And the eventual impact of prisoner courses of the policy to end automatic early release will be some years in the future. But the Cabinet Secretary, I'm sure, will work with the Scottish Prison Service to ensure that appropriate access can take place so that prisoners can access the support that they need to rehabilitate. Presiding Officer Radio 4 um, had a programme this week which was uh, both informative and at times challenging to listen to. Um, it was called Inside the Sex Offenders Prison. It was a documentary made by Rex Bloomstein, um, a documentary filmmaker who had unprecedented access to H Her Majesty's Prison Wotton in Nottinghamshire, which is the largest sex offender prison in Europe. And his role was to investigate how inmates are rehabilitated for release. This is Europe's biggest prison of sex offenders. And um, my colleague Stuart Stevenson was talking about sex offenders. And it's noted that in Watton, no distinction is made by the type of sex offence. Um, the absolute focus on is the recognisation that there are victims to all of the crimes and, and is about the prisoners taking responsibility for their actions. Lynn Saunders, the governor, said it's a great leveller. She said, you've got everyone you could imagine. She adds vicars, teachers, airline pilots, police officers, prison officers, doctors, people with learning disabilities, people who have low IQ, Q, and also people with complex me mental health problems are all represented in the prison community. Approximately half of those prisoners are on determinate sentences and know the release date, the rest do not. But what Watton has become um, known for is its specialist treatment centre for the rehabilitation, offering a wide range of sex offender treatment programmes more than any other prison in the UK. The overwhelming majority of its inmates have accepted their crimes and are working to address them and the range of offences that they've been convicted of, for, uh, which varies considerably, as I've already stated. And David Porter, who's one of Watton's most experienced facilitators, says... That is, what, what, what we do at Watton is to try to get them to understand the harm done to others, the harm done to themselves, and ways of identifying the warning signs when they get out so that they are, they are not set on the path to offending again. As I said, this was a very challenging documentary at times and, and was not an easy listen, as it was said. And um, it, it actually addressed some of the issues that... Um, such as the negative emotions of shame and guilt that were held by the prisoners were a huge barrier to the treatment process and they had to work through to actually build the self-esteem of, of the prisoners. And um, the documentary maker um, frequently addressed the paradox here. Um, I think it was mentioned by Elaine Murray about the societal pressures and the pressures on us as politicians and how we view offenders and how they should be dealt with. Um, and he, he addressed this paradox. On the one hand, we want sex offenders to be profoundly remorseful about their crimes, but the process of rehabilitation demands that they go far beyond that to actually address and, and prevent their reoffending. And it's interesting, many people have talked about the low rate of reoffending from sex offenders, and um, in, in the governor, um, Saunders of um, the prison noted that it was only 6% compared to general population of prisoners of a reoffending rate of over 50%. So they seem to have had a great success here. And the reason I wanted to highlight that is that the rehabilitation programmes and the resourcing of those programmes um, obviously um, is a big challenge to the government and I look forward to how the minister might discuss how he would approach some of these areas as it's absolutely vital as we take this bill forward that rehabilitation is at the core of what we're doing in the prisons in order that this um, society as a whole is satisfied that this bill takes it forward. I'd just like to finish, presiding officer, by commending the bold approach that the minister has taken. Um, the cabinet secretary, in my mind, has approached the stage one um, deliberations and listened to the evidence and reacted to them and I think his decision to um, close, um, not to um, build the prison, women's prison in Greenock is um, a testament of his absolute commitment to, to prisoner reform. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. I now call on John Finney 
Uh, six minutes or thereby, please, Mr Finney. Um, thank you, President Officer. I too would like to thank the many people who contributed uh, evidence and which formed the basis of our report. And I'd like to quote straight away from one of them, and that's Professor Fergus McNeill of Glasgow University, who said, and I quote, to put it crudely, simply storing the risky for a little bit longer doesn't in fact serve to reduce it. The key issue for public safety is the condition in and conditions under which people are detained and then released, not how long they serve. How long they serve is principally a matter of just deserts or proportionality of punishment to the offence. The Professor McNeill also encourages us to raise the level of debate, and for that reason I welcome the change which uh, was initially saw the restriction to sex offenders and those over 10 years. I think that uh, may have been popular, but it certainly wasn't evidenced by the issues like offending, re-offending rates that we heard of. Um, so, whilst some still want to talk tough, I would sooner that we talk just and effective. And uh, it's been a very wide-ranging debate, which has stretched beyond the terms of this Stage 1 report. And like some others, I'm certainly, uh, rather than be critical of the Scottish Government for the approach that's been taken for once, I think it's, it's good to record that it's commendable that people have listened and responded accordingly. Now, I'm going to uh, mention a, a, another uh, contribution we received, and that was recalibration of sentencing, I quote here, so that when a sentence is announced or laid down in court, it relates to a real time rather than it being something which has been chopped and changed around would be very helpful indeed for everyone involved. From the perpetrator who has been convicted, convicted to the victim, a huge amount of clarity is required, but we have potential to join things together and come up with something coherent which we don't have at the moment. Now, that was not said by a Conservative politician. That was said by Pete White of Positive Prisons, Positive Futures. And I think, I think it's very important that we have clarity. The policy memorandum talks about reducing offending and improving public safety, and everyone surely can go along with that. The policy memorandum also talks about the minimum period of compulsory supervision in the, the community. So we must understand again what the purpose of prison is. It is to punish. Um, but it's also to improve public safety. And we heard the Minister, Cabinet Secretary, sorry, on more than one occasion talk about dangerous prisoners. But crucially, it's about long-term reintegration, or I might suggest integration, because many of the people who are in prison and find themselves a subject of custodial sentences have never really been integrated to society in the first place. So years before the effects of this proposal will actually kick in and there will be an opportunity to see reintegration. And in my book, that will be the gauge of the effectiveness in these proposals, how they'll be judged. But as I say, that's some time in the future. Um, I think we need to look out with the prison walls too and uh, commend the outward-looking approach of the uh, Chief Executive, Colin McConnell, and his staff. Um, they've welcomed the proposed guaranteed minimum period of release. Um, and as has been said on more than one occasion, it's important that we continually assess the risks and put in place measures to address these risks. And one such measure I would suggest is not only the two-day early release, but the fact that Scottish prison servants now have outreach workers who are in an ability to facilitate the integration that I think we all want to see. Um, part of that integration, of course, will be about the effectiveness of the management programmes within the prisons. And we've heard, and there are indeed challenges around that, we heard from the Scottish Prison Service that these are, and I quote, resource intensive and require specialist delivery skills. We also heard they deliver at the most appropriate time in their sentence, taking into account their willingness and readiness to engage. And crucially, I think the availability of programmes, which has been a concern for us all. Um, I think it's important too to say that prisoners are not one uniform group and it has to be an individual assessment of individual needs. Uh, um, re reference has been made to uh, the purposeful activity review undertaken by the Scottish Prison Service and the Scottish Government's response to that uh, did talk about de developing learning and employability skills to build life skills and resilience to motivate personal engagement both uh, with the prison and community based services uh, and that uh, was, again was welcomed by positive uh, prisons positive future. The role of the parole board has been mentioned, and, and I absolutely agree with the Cabinet Secretary that I trust their judgment, and we do know that they welcome the, the proposed period of post-release. Um, the, the Cabinet Secretary sought views on the minimum period, and I, I know the figure of six months has been mentioned, and I would like to, to make a suggestion. My view is it's not about quality, in other words, the length, it's about uh, the, the quantity, it is about the quality, and it would be important to have in place all robust mechanisms to support people when they have been released. Um, 
Scottish Human Rights Commission have uh, uh, um, made men been mentioned here, and, and I hope that there will be a, a positive response from the government to that. Um, early release has frequently been talked about, and that's beyond the gift of this particular chamber there, because one of the particular challenges, of course it's housing, but it's also about benefits, and actually having DWP on board for anything that's done would be very helpful. I would also like to see a move to end short sentences. I want to see robust community disposals, Social Work Scotland talk about proposed reforms, but a review of sentencing guidelines. Uh, I also want to see more, the Scottish Government do more than simply note the suggestion of extending MAPA provisions. If we are wanting to enhance public safety, then ideally that will take in violent offenders too, not just sexual offenders. Um, coordination across the criminal justice system has frequently been mentioned. That is the key to this, as far as I am concerned. I think this has been a, a challenging um, initial um, approach from the Scottish Government. I welcome the reform, reforms that uh, are being suggested, but I still think rather than talk tough, let's talk t just and let's talk effective. Thank you. Many thanks. We now move to closing speeches and I invite the members who have taken part in the debate to return to the Chamber. Now call on Annabel Goldie, six minutes or thereby, please. Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. This um, debate has revealed a conundrum. To me, automatic early release is something which you either support or you oppose. If you support it, you have it. If you oppose it, you don't have it at all. And my party has a distinguished record of alone in this parliament consistently opposing automatic early release. And yes, it was a Conservative government at Westminster which over 20 years ago introduced automatic early release. And it was a Conservative government which, recognising that automatic early release failed victims, failed judges and failed the public, passed legislation to abolish it. Legislation which was never implemented by the incoming Labour government of 18 years ago. And since 1999, it has been this Parliament's responsibility to deal with with this issue, and my party has been unequivocal in our criticism of automatic early release. Since 1999, I have spoken in numerous debates in this Parliament condemning it. My party has frequently brought amendments ending automatic early release to this chamber, only to be defeated by all the other parties. So as a political principle, let me just expand my argument. So as a political principle, Deputy Presiding Officer, the credentials of my party could not be clearer on this issue. And it was heartening to find that by 2007 we had acquired a political ally. Because in both its 2007 and 2011 Scottish election manifestos, the SNP committed to abolishing automatic early release of offenders. It said in 2007 that it believes there should be an end to the automatic uh, release of offenders. And they said we support the recent legislation in this area and in government we will drive forward this important area of reform. And they echoed that in 2011. They said, we will build on the work already done and will involve the Sentencing Council in further action to address unconditional early automatic release. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, it seemed that our arguments had won over a new adherent to the principle of ending automatic early release. But in politics, principle is not enough. It needs to be married with policy to deliver what is pledged. And it's disappointing that eight years on, we have from an SNP government a proposal not to abolish automatic early release, but to introduce a partial and heavily qualified abolition. And according to Spice, the bill as introduced in 2012-13 would have applied to 107 people convicted of sexual crimes and 24 people convicted of other crimes and offences. And that total figure of 131 offenders would have represented less than 1% of all people receiving a determinate custodial sentence. So we have an abandonment of the principle and a, a divergence from these earlier manifesto commitments. Now let me make clear, Deputy Presiding Officer, I do not disagree that introducing abolition of automatic... Just bear with me. I do not disagree that introducing abolition of automatic early release is not straightforward. It is not. There is a need, and many members have contributed eloquently on this point. There is a need to address prison capacity, to address whatever issues confront the prisoner, be that drug addiction, alcohol dependency, illiteracy, innumeracy, and to prepare the prisoner for release. But these are issues of management. They should neither intrude upon nor detract from the kernel principle of you either have automatic early release or you don't. 
just bear with me. What we currently have from the Scottish Government is a proposal to scrap automatic early release for a tiny percentage of prisoners. It doesn't affect short-term prisoners and it affects only some long-term prisoners. Now, in my opinion, presiding officer, that is not good enough. And the Scottish Government, I suppose sensitive to perceived shortcomings in the Bill, proposes to bring forward significant amendments at Stage 2. Now, these proposals do not, in my opinion, address the fundamental shortcomings of a partial end to automatic early release, but the proposals certainly raise issues of process for this uh, Parliament, because the new proposals would apply to approximately 450 offenders, or just 3% of all people who received a custodial sentence in 2013-14. And what the Justice Committee is now being asked to do is to form a view on these proposals as part of its Stage 1 report, without sight of a revised policy memorandum, without sight of a financial memorandum, or without sight of explanatory notes on the Bill. And that is not conducive to scrutiny. Mr Stevenson? Mr Stevenson. Uh, I'm obliged to the member. Um, while accepting that uh, the member will be correct to point to the small percentage of prisoners, I wonder if the member will accept that it is a very, very much larger proportion of the increased prisoner nights that will be derived because it is the longest sentences that are being lengthened and therefore it is appropriate to proceed in a way that makes sure we're able not to lose the principle through difficulties in implementation. I was expecting an intervention, not a dissertation. Um, what Mr Stevenson doesn't address is the fundamental intellectual conundrum. In my opinion, you either believe in automatic early release or you don't. But we do. But we do. And why not deliver it? Because you're not delivering it. No. And, and that, is, that is the fundamental Can problem confronting... Can we stop confronting... shouting across the chamber, please, and allow Ms Golda to continue? Thank you for your protection, presiding officer. Um, that is a fundamental conundrum. And that is why that this bill, even with the government's proposed flourishes, does not end automatic early release. And nobody can pretend it can. And Labour have been very honest about that. And they've actually been quite frank in revealing their sense of, of identifying a paradox about this, feeling it's not going far enough, but they still want to support it. In the opinion of my party, presiding officer, the bill as structured and as proposed does not provide victims, it does not provide their families, and it does not provide judges with the simplicity and the clarity which they need and to which they are entitled when a sentence is being imposed. And it's for that reason, presiding officer, that my party will abstain on the vote tonight. It, it, I now call Hugh Henry, Mr Henry, eight minutes. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, can I start off echoing some of the comments that have been made about the role of the, the Cabinet Secretary? Uh, I want to congratulate him, actually, for trying to do the best that he can to make something sensible out of, frankly, what is an incoherent and unacceptable bill. And I think he is showing goodwill to this Parliament in trying to sort out a mess which he has inherited. Because, frankly, presiding officer, this is a bad way to make legislation. This actually undermines the credibility of this Parliament. We prided ourselves when the Parliament was set up about how we would be different and how we would make good legislation, how we would listen and how we would then reflect the advice that we heard in our strong and powerful committees. And that hasn't happened in this case, and it's not happening in this case. Because what we have before us, and it's ridiculous, presiding officer, we are having a debate about stage one of a bill in the full knowledge that what will be considered at stage two will be completely different. John Finney. John Finney. I, I'm grateful for the, the member taking the intervention, but does that not precisely prove the point that there has been robust scrutiny? Hugh Henry. I, I, I think you failed to understand what I was saying. I'm not criticising the committee, because actually it's because we have one of the best committees in the Parliament looking at this that we are going to be able to make substantial changes. My criticism 
as of a Scottish Government bringing to this Parliament a bill that in many senses is not fit for purpose. Now, the Labour Party, Scottish Labour tonight, will be supporting stage one, but we do so with severe and significant reservations because we are having to debate something, frankly, that is a debate in the abstract. We do not know what is going to come before us at stage two. We support the principles, but we have not got a clue about what will be coming before us. Now, President Officer, I share your aspirations about the way that this Parliament needs to change and its committees need to change. But maybe one of the things that we should all collectively do is reflect on the process that this bill is demonstrating. Being asked to make significant decisions with an absence of detail, with an absence of clarity. And it doesn't do anyone any good trying to make a decision on that basis. It doesn't help the public, it doesn't help the victims. We know what the principle is and we can sign up to it. And in a sense, it's a shame that some of the debate this afternoon has actually started, because of the lack of substance in this bill, has actually started to veer onto a wider debate about sentencing, prison policy and rehabilitation. And that is actually a debate that this Parliament does need to have at some point, and I hope that we will get that opportunity. But this is a specific bill about early release, not about wider prison policy, a specific bill about a very specific thing, and yet we are not seeing the detail. The, the Cabinet Secretary is not able to tell us today what is the, in, the, in the detail that you know, Christine Graham wants to come in, by all means. Just simply uh, to, to Hugh Henry, that we are simply voting on the general principles of ending automatic early release for long-term sentences. There is every opportunity, as you're well aware, at stage two for a substantive amendment to fall, and indeed at stage three. Now, it's not the best way forward, but it has shown committee procedure here at stage one, and it will at stage two, doing its utmost to make good legislation. Hugh Henry. I have every confidence in Christine Graham and her committee, and I'm thankful that it is the Justice Committee that will be considering it. But that doesn't excuse the failure of the Scottish Government to bring something coherent to us today to consider. It is not good practice to say that we will vote and press the buttons today on a principle, but we actually don't know what the detail is that we're voting on. Yes, by all means, change bills and improve and amend, but we're taking evidence from people and then we're saying to them, actually, do you know something? What we're going to do once we get to the detail is possibly something different from what we debated and discussed at stage one. No, thank you. Do you know, a number of people have made comments about the parole board, Michael Matheson, Christine Graham uh, uh, and others. And Stuart Stevenson, I think, hit the nail in the head. We cannot make these changes unless we are prepared to invest resources to make the parole board work effectively. And Jane Baxter, Margaret McDougall and others spoke about the need for clarity for victims. Because at the bottom of any argument in this has got to be the fundamental principle that we should be given the victims the clarity that they deserve when it comes to sentencing. And we should be making sure that our judges have the wherewithal to do that properly. But as Elaine Murray said, we now have a policy document that, and frankly, is not fit for purpose. We have a financial memorandum that is actually based on something completely different. You know, we, we'll vote for that today, but we don't know actually whether the financial memorandum that will eventually come will be anything like the financial memorandum that's there just now, because it's going to be a completely different bill. This is not the way to make good legislation. This has got nothing to do with party politics, presiding officer. This is an observation about the way that this parliament is working. And this is a poor example. And I'm not critical of the cabinet secretary because he is doing his best to sort out this mess. So we will have a bill, as many of the members, Elaine Murray, Margaret Mitchell, uh, Roderick Campbell e even uh, suggested, a bill that will be totally different at stage two from what is under consideration. And Nigel Don 
is absolutely right. There is a need for parliamentary scrutiny. But we cannot scrutinise if we don't have the information. And stage two is going to be critical because, in a sense, stage two, in, as Christine Graham rightly said, in inviting evidence, stage two is actually going to have to now do the job that should have been done before stage one, going back into that detail. It's not just about evidence on the amendments. We're actually going to have to go back in to look at evidence on uh, some of the fundamental principles. Now, a number of members talked about the Sentencing Council and presiding officer. We've got this whole process back to front. The Sentencing Council, which was promised long ago, should have been set up, should have been coming forward with recommendations so that this bill could have fitted in to the deliberation of the Sentencing Council instead of setting up a Sentencing Council after we have this bill. And can I finish off, presiding officer, by making reference to some of the comments that Christina McKelvey uh, mentioned about broader policy, and, and I mentioned this earlier. I do think that the debate on women's reoffending and the recommendations from Dame Eilish Angelini um, are pertinent to that wider debate, but we need to fit this bill now into that wider debate because, and, and this, we need to get out the party politics of this because, you know, the SNP don't want to spend money on prisons because it wouldn't be seen to the right thing to do. Labour won't come forward with proposals that says we need to spend more money on the criminal justice system because that might not play well. The Conservatives want to do their bit, the Lib Dems do, and the Greens. We are all hesitant about doing something that is maybe the right thing. So we need to have a debate. Are we willing to spend more money on prisons, on more prisons, but smaller prisons? Are we willing to spend more money on rehabilitation that has been mentioned time after time after time? Because if we don't, we are investing in failure and we are investing in the surety of having to spend more in the future. So we need to have that debate about our prison system, about our justice system, about the way that prisoners are prepared for release. But at the end of it, it's got to be coming down to safer communities, justice for victims, clarity for victims. But, you know, as long as we are dancing around each other, playing party politics, and as long as we are having to look at... No, you need to come to a close, Mr Henry. I am not going to engage. I don't have the time to engage in that. But as long as we will not as a parliament address some of the fundamentals about the way to make improvements and as long as we bring forward a bill in this cat-handed way we are never going to advance the arguments at all thank you i now call the cabinet secretary to wind up uh, mr martin about five o'clock thank you presiding officer can i begin by saying that um, i think it's been a very useful debate and there's obviously been a whole range of different contributions around uh, the content of this bill, and I think as John Finney correctly says, it's a debate that has gone much wider than the bill in itself, which, uh, from my practical experience, is an unusual of stage one debates, where very often uh, individual members will raise issues that are related to the legislation uh, and the debate that's taking place, but will obviously uh, bring in issues of concern uh, or experience that they feel are relevant to uh, that debate in itself. Uh, can I... Um, also say, as I mentioned in my uh, opening comments, that I fully recognise the detailed scrutiny that the Justice Committee have given to uh, this particular piece of legislation. As someone that served on the Justice Committee for almost seven years, I'm well aware of the detail and the type of scrutiny that the Committee uh, undertakes in these matters. And as I would expect with any piece of legislation for a Committee of this Parliament, to identify where there are areas that can be improved and to highlight issues of concern that has been highlighted to them in the course of evidence by witnesses, either orally or in written forum, uh, to highlight that as part of their stage one report. I think that's one of the real strengths of this particular uh, parliament. I must say I am a little confused at some of the suggestion of what the government is now doing is uh, in some way uh, not acceptable because we, what I'm trying to do is to respond to some of the concerns. That we, can I finish a point I want to make, first of all, Mr Henry? What I'm trying to do is respond to some of the concerns and issues that have been raised by the committee, both by committee members, by witnesses to the committee, and to try at the stage one debate 
which is why I responded to the Stage 1 report in the Government's response prior to this debate taking place, setting out how we would approach some of the concerns and issues that the Committee have raised in their Stage 1 debate. I see that as being a mature, reasonable way to conduct this type of debate. What I would say is inappropriate is for a Government, one, not to set out at the Stage 1 stage how it was going to deal with these issues, and also to then just push on, irrespective as to what the committee has heard, and not respond to those issues. I will give way to Mr Henry on this point. Hugh Henry. The Cabinet Secretary is absolutely right. That is the mature way to deal with it. And I congratulate him for it. He is doing the right thing. The problem is that we are going to have a bill at stage two that is fundamentally different from what was introduced. And the failure is in the way that the government prepared and introduced that bill in the first place. That's what we've got to examine. Cabinet Secretary. Sign officer, um, I think it's probably, it would probably be fair to say, saying that the bill will be fundamentally different is probably, let's say, over-egging it slightly. But I know the point that the member is trying to make, clearly for no political purposes. But what I do recognise is that uh, we are bringing in uh, uh, amendments at stage two, and as I've experienced in my time in committees in this parliament, in different types of committees, it isn't unusual to take further evidence at stage two based on the amendments that government brings forward. And I experienced that with the previous administration as well. So I think that's an important element of this process. So anyway, I've set out the approach that we're going to take, and I would fully expect the committee to take further evidence, as Elaine Murray stated in her own contribution at stage two, to consider these issues. Now, as I mentioned, this is a, a debate that has gone wider than just the particular remit of this particular piece of legislation itself. It's gone into penal policy, sentencing policy and a whole range of other uh, matters as well. And I think it, when it comes to penal policy, I believe that everybody in this chamber, or I would hope everybody in this chamber, uh, agrees with the McLeish, uh, McLeish's, uh, Henry McLeish's Prison Commission's view. And that is, and I quote uh, Henry McLeish's report, the evidence uh, that we have reviewed leads us to the conclusion that to use imprisonment wisely is to target it where it can be most effective in punishing serious crime and protecting the public. The approach that we will be taking forward as a government is intended to achieve that in a range of different ways. Now, a number of members have raised a whole range of issues uh, relating to penal policy. The first issue I want to address is the issue around the delivery of programmes within the prison estate as well, um, because there are a whole range of programmes which are delivered within the prison estate. And Elaine Murray raised quite legitimately issues about access to those particular programmes uh, uh, within our prison system. She will be aware there has been the purposeful activity review that has been undertaken around how activities are delivered within the prison estate. There is now work being taken forward to implement the recommendations which have come forward as a result of that. And we now are going to go into an independent review of programmes, including psychological programmes, that are delivered within the SPS estate. Once we have that report, the SPS will then be able to look at how they can build on the programmes that they have at the present time. There are broadly seven strands of programmes that the SPS take forward, eh, along with a whole range of other activity mechanisms. And the review, which will be independent out, uh, by an independent person from the SPS, will consider all of these issues. But I also said when I attended the committee that when there is an anxiety about access to uh, these types of programmes, about access to these programmes within the prison estate, a very significant amount of the resource within our prison estate is drawn into dealing with short-term offenders and the churn of short-term offenders within our prison system. Now, if members are serious, are serious about dealing with the whole issue, about more effective resourcing of rehabilitation programmes within our prison system, they have to also be serious about dealing with the churn of short-term offenders. To do otherwise is completely missing the point and entirely unrealistic in being able to do, do, deal with that effectively. I am more than happy to have that debate and the approach that I have set out in terms of taking an approach about making sure that we use our resources in a way that are much more evidence-based is the approach that I intend to take. And when Hugh Henry makes the issue a point about whether we should invest in prisons or not because of the political perception, I would add 
that as a government we have spent over half a billion pounds since we came into government in investing within our prison estate in order to improve it and to improve the quality of what can be provided there. And on the issue that was raised by Christina McKelvey in her contribution when she mentioned the whole issue of dealing with women offenders, the cheap option was to build Inverclyde Prison. But the approach that we have set out as a government that we are going to take is much more evidence-based and the way in which we will design that approach will be one which is more costly to us. But we will do so mindful that the outcomes will be better and it will actually deliver safer communities as a result. I'll give way to Lane Murray. Murray. And I'm not in any way disagreeing with what you're saying, but surely you're actually demonstrating the point that my colleague Hugh Henry was making, that these debates have to be, discussions have to be removed from the party political battle. We have to actually discuss this within, in a sensible way, not having a go at each other, because we're not actually going to resolve many of these issues if it becomes a sort of political football. Well, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure about the, the political football stuff because the, the group that we've established is made up of a whole range of different stakeholders to advise on how we move forward with the, uh, the female prison estate and how we can manage that. We had the Eilish Angelini Commission, we had the McLeish Commission, all independent of government, saying out very clearly about the measures that we should take uh, in a non-party political way, and that's how we'll continue to approach this matter. Can I turn, though, to the issue about the Conservatives' position on automatic early release? I have tried, I have tried in the course of this debate and also when I read the stage one report to deal with the intellectual conundrum that Annabel Goldie highlighted here today and that is the logic of the Conservative Party not to support the ending of automatic early release for our most serious criminals. Now, as Annabel Goldie stated in her contribution, the Conservative Party have a distinguished history in this issue, a very distinguished one. They introduced automatic early release for all prisoners. Now, the logic that we are not supporting a bill for ending automatic early release for our most serious prisoners, because it doesn't also do it for short-term prisoners, I'm afraid is beyond me. Now, when the member makes the point that... But the member, let me just finish this point here, though. But when the member makes the point that this only affects 3% of the prison estate or prisoners who will be affected by the change in this policy, I'm mindful of what the UK government have said in this issue. And that is Chris Galing, their member who is responsible for this area of policy in England. And I quote, I've got limitation on the number of prison, prison places I've got. So I have started with the most serious offenders. Exactly what we are doing here in Scotland. He then goes on and states, it's not something I can change overnight, but it's something I'm going to change step by step, and I'm starting with the most dangerous and unpleasant people. Exactly what the Scottish exactly. Government are doing. Exactly. Now, if it's good enough for the Conservatives in Westminster, why is it not good enough for the Conservatives here in Scotland? Margaret Mitchell. So will have to be brief, Ms Mitchell. Brief. I'm, I'm very briefly, I'm puzzled why you should, um, given this is a, a devolved issue, be seeking to look at what's happening in England. Position is quite clear. We are in favour of the ending of automatic early release for all prisoners. This bill does not do that. We are abstaining this evening in the hope that the radical changes the Cabinet Secretary has been forced to make to this bill can again be looked at to bring some common sense here so that as stage two, it is effectively abolishing automatic early release, not for 3%, but for 100%. Cabinet Secretary, you need population. to be brief. Uh, President Order, I, I will be brief. The message from the Chamber here tonight with the position of the Conservative Party is they want to maintain automatic early release for long-term prisoners. To vote otherwise, to vote against this bill or to abstain in this bill is a message that you sent out. You introduced it and tonight it looks as though you're seeking to preserve it in place. President Officer, this is a bill that is an important step forward in ending automatic early release. We set that out in our manifesto at the last election. We are taking that forward in this legislation and I would call on all members to support the general principles tonight.
That concludes the debate on stage one of the Prisoners' Control of Release Scotland Bill. We now move to the next item of business, which is consideration of motion number 11827 in the name of John Swinney on the financial resolution on the Prisoners' Control of Release Scotland Bill. I call on John Swinney to move the motion. It moved, President Officer. Thank you. The question on this motion will be put at decision time, to which we now come. There are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is at motion number 12878 in the name of Michael Matheson, on the Prisoners' Control of Release Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament has not agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 12878 in the name of Michael Matheson is as follows. Yes, 70. No, 0. There were 10 abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is at motion number 11827 in the name of John Swinney on the financial resolution for the Prisoners' Control of Release Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. I hope you, the sun shines on you and you manage to get some rest. <laughs>